Hey peeps, today we're looking at some of the most common mistakes made in the apologetics and counter-apologetics sphere, as well as in just internet philosophy and religion debates more generally. It's no surprise that there are lots of mistakes out there in the festering cesspool of internet debates about religion, but you'd be surprised at how much we can learn from reflecting on and correcting these mistakes, and that's the purpose of this series. Yes, series, not video. I'm actually making seven videos in total on these mistakes, so if you want to avoid stumbling over the same pitfalls that many fall into, and if you want to learn some philosophy along the way, just sit back, relax, stick around, hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you know when the other videos are out, and enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and as I said at the outset, today we're in part one of an epic series covering common mistakes about philosophy and religion. Before getting into the mistakes, let's get some preliminary notes on the table. First, these mistakes are in no particular order. Second, there's going to be some emphasis on being unconventional here. I didn't just want to go for the obviously mistaken low-hanging fruit. I'll include some of that to be sure, but lots of the mistakes will be prevalent but underappreciated, undernoticed, and not frequently talked about. I wanted to choose mistakes whose correction we could all learn from. These are generally not going to be mistakes that professional philosophers make, although a disturbingly large number of them will be. The majority, though, perhaps the majority, are ones that predominate on the internet. Now, third, I can't hope to be exhaustive or representative of common or annoying mistakes that people in the internet philosophy and religion sphere make. I had to exclude lots of good candidates simply to avoid each video being 12 hours long, of course. Fourth, there will be varying degrees of explanation that I'll offer for each mistake, since I've already done a lot of work correcting some of these mistakes. Don't worry, though. In those cases, I'll point you to exactly where I've addressed them. So be sure to check out the resource document that I created for this video and which I've linked in the description. Fifth, I should also say at this juncture that I prepared over 130 pages of super helpful notes in total for this series of videos, and patrons have full access to those notes for each video in the series as they come out. So if you see value in the work that I do and want to procure lots of super cool goodies, consider becoming a patron. There are also bonus videos, exclusive content, lots of fun stuff for patrons. Link to all that is in the description. Sixth, I don't say you're irrational if you fall prey to some of these mistakes. I'm really just trying to help all of us rid ourselves of error and confusion. Seventh, this video is meant to be a reference guide. When you, yes you, when you see people on social media make these mistakes, for instance on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, even OnlyFans, just kindly link them to the relevant video in my series and the relevant timestamp wherein the mistake is addressed. Eighth, don't worry, the other videos in this series won't be as long as this first one. Um, this will probably be the longest and most technical of them all. But that also means that it's the juiciest of them all. Uh, of course, the other ones will be extremely juicy too. I never hold back on the juice. Okay, but before getting on to the specific mistakes, let's get an overview of the series. Again, I'll be breaking this up into a series of seven videos. Part one, which is this video, is going to be covering epistemology, methodology, and behavior. So that's going to be covering things like mistakes and confusions about belief and credence and knowledge, probability, evidence, Bayesianism, intuition, mistakes about the nature of arguments and the purpose of arguments, dialectics, methodology, the nature of philosophy as well, and finally mistakes that people make relating to their behavior and dispositions. In part two of the series, we're going to be covering theism, atheism, naturalism, and agnosticism, as well as like theists, atheists, agnostics, what naturalism is, what it is to be a theist, what it is to be an atheist, what it is to be an agnostic, etc. In part three, we'll be looking at the Kalam and contingency arguments. In part four, we'll be looking at the moral argument, fine-tuning argument, and ontological arguments. Part five, we'll be looking at the problem of evil and divine hiddenness. Part six, we'll be looking at models of God, divine simplicity, and Thomism. Part seven, we'll be looking at mistakes pertaining to free will, Christianity, and consciousness. Okay, onwards we march then to the first mistake, mistake number one. There are actually 177 mistakes in total over the seven-part series. So, and, and some of those are broken up into like sub-mistakes, so... There are more than 177. The first mistake is just confusions abound regarding belief, knowledge, credence, and certainty. And I actually made a community post way back when, and a number of people just wanted me to clarify what are beliefs, like wh how does that relate to knowledge, wh how does this relate to certainty? A number of people said that. So I actually used a lot of your guys' feedback in this series. So first, what is belief? Well, uh, to begin to understand what belief is, it's helpful to understand what kind of thing it is. Specifically, belief is a kind of propositional attitude. That is, it's an attitude or stance that an agent adopts toward a proposition. Roughly speaking, propositions are the meanings of declarative sentences. They're essentially just what sentences express. They're also capable of having truth values. That is, they're capable of being true or being false. 
So for example, the sentences snow is white and schnee ist weiss both express the same proposition, namely the proposition that snow is white. And usually philosophers use these weird brackets here to refer to propositions that are expressed by the sentences contained therein. And note that the proposition isn't in like the language English, right? Instead, it's what's expressed by the relevant English sentence, as well as what other corresponding sentences in other languages express, like schnee ist weiss and la neige ist blanc, or however you pronounce it. Sorry, I don't do French. Getting more specific, a belief is a purely representational propositional attitude. When we attribute a belief to someone, we're simply describing how they take the world to be, or how they represent the world as being. We're saying that they're taking a stance on the relevant proposition, that they're affirming its truth, that they think it's true, that they're taking it to be true, or representing the world as being the way that the proposition says it is. So a belief, then, is a purely representational propositional attitude, wherein a subject affirms a proposition as true, or represents the world as being such that, blah blah blah, right, insert the proposition. Now, as an aside here, some people will say, like, I have no beliefs. And I say, oh, yes, yes, you do. You take the world to be certain ways, right? You affirm certain propositions to be true, such as that you're hearing a voice right now, or that smoking causes lung cancer, etc. Etc. Right. Okay, so that's belief. What about knowledge? Well, let me just say at the outset that there's probably not going to be a good analysis of knowledge which specifies the exact conditions under which anyone has knowledge under any possible circumstances. Okay, we're probably not going to get, in other words, clean, necessary, and sufficient conditions for knowledge. But at least we can like roughly say at first pass that knowledge is something like ungettiered, justified, true belief. Now, I will explain what that is in just a second. Now, plausibly, you need to believe something to know it. Right? Like, if you know that 1 plus 1 equals 2, well, then obviously you take it to be the case that 1 plus 1 equals 2. In other words, you represent the world as being such that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Or, more simply, you just you believe the proposition. If you don't even believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2, say because you've never even formed the concept of numbers, or you erroneously think that 1 plus 1 equals 7, well, then obviously you don't know that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Importantly, your belief also has to be true in order for you to know it. It would be absurd to say that someone knows that 1 plus 1 equals 3 since 1 plus 1 is decidedly not 3, and one cannot know a falsehood. In other words, if you know that p, then p is true. p's truth is a necessary condition on knowing p. Plausibly, you also need to be justified in believing as you do in order for that belief to count as knowledge. You need, in other words, some support or warrant for your belief. Consider that if you just randomly guess the answer on a math test and you somehow convince yourself into believing it, then you clearly don't know the answer, even if your guess actually ends up being correct. And the reason you don't know the answer is that plausibly you don't have adequate justification for your belief. So in order to know something, you need to believe it, it needs to be true, you plausibly need to have some sort of justification for it, and then the final condition, being ungettiered, is much harder to pin down. Famously, philosophers largely accepted that knowledge was simply justified true belief, until philosopher Edmund Gettier came along and offered some pretty convincing counterexamples to this view of knowledge, as did many other philosophers in his wake. These counterexamples are known as Gettier cases. So basically, this condition on knowledge is really just ensuring that you're not in a Gettier case. There are lots of views about how to flesh out this condition, that is, about what precisely should be added to the justified true belief analysis to ensure that you're not in a Gettier case. It might be that the justification or basis of your belief should be like non-accidentally connected to the truth of the belief. Like It shouldn't just be a matter of luck or coincidence, for instance, that your belief is correct. Instead, the grounds for your belief should be connected up to the truth in some appropriate way. Or, alternatively, it might be that your belief should have no defeaters, that is, no true propositions that, when added to your stock of beliefs, would result in the relevant belief being unjustified. And so on down the list of other ways someone might try to flush out this condition of being ungettiered. The debates here are ferocious, and I'm not trying to settle them. Instead, my point is just to give a very rough gloss on what knowledge is, or might be, without people screaming at me that I've overlooked the complexity associated with Gettier cases. And believe me, if this were a professional philosophy article, almost every sentence I've said would require multiple footnotes containing clarifications, caveats, distinctions, and nods to complexities and controversies. I hope, though, that you can forgive me for simplifying things for ease of presentation, since my goal isn't to cover these complexities and controversies, but instead to highlight the differences between belief, knowledge, credence, certainty, etc. So then, we've gone over belief and knowledge, and what now about credence? Well, like belief, credence is a propositional attitude. That is, it's an attitude or stance that one can take towards a proposition. More specifically, your credence in a proposition is basically just how confident you are in the proposition. It's your degree or level of confidence in the proposition, and it's represented using a quantitative degreed scale from 0% to 100%, or from 0 to 1. You might be 100% confident, that is, absolutely certain, 
that one plus one equals two. You might be 0% confident that triangles have four sides. That is, you're absolutely certain that it's false. You might be 50% confident that the number of stars in the universe is even. You might be 80% confident that it'll rain tomorrow, and so on. All of these numerical descriptions represent your credences or levels of confidence in the various propositions. So what's the difference between beliefs and credence? And why should we countenance credences in addition to beliefs? Well, uh, you can see my Bayes theorem video for more on this, but very briefly, beliefs are binary. Right? Given any particular proposition and agent, the agent either believes it or doesn't. End of story. But credences aren't binary like that. Right? They're quantitative and graded in a way that beliefs aren't. Of course, right? don't get me wrong, it's true that either someone does have a credence toward a proposition, or they don't have a credence toward a proposition. But the point is that if someone has a credence toward a proposition, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> Instead, their credence will be quantitative in a way that beliefs obviously aren't, and it'll be graded in a way that beliefs obviously aren't. You know, you can kind of go 0%, 10%, 5%, 18%, etc. etc. And indeed, very plausibly, we have different levels of confidence with respect to certain propositions. I might believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2, and I might also believe that it won't rain tomorrow, but I'm certainly not as confident in the latter as I am in the former. Okay, so we've gone over beliefs, knowledge, and credence. What about certainty? Well, there are at least two different senses of certainty that I think we should distinguish. One sense is a kind of psychological sense of certainty, which is just when your kind of personal credence is one. That is like your personal level of confidence in a proposition is 100%. Like you personally are 100% confident that the proposition is true. And that's just a psychological sense. It's a description of how confident you are in the relevant proposition. But there are various different normative senses of certainty that we can distinguish from the mere descriptive psychological sense. We might say that certainty is a matter of being justified in having credence one. Someone might unfortunately be absolutely certain that vaccines cause autism or something like that. In that sense, they're psychologically certain in it. Their credence is one. They don't think there's even a remote chance that they could be wrong. And yet very plausibly, they're not justified in having a credence of one because very plausibly their evidence base doesn't provide conclusive justification for thinking that that's true. And indeed there's mountains of evidence against their view. So then different normative senses of certainty would just be something like a justified credence in one, or when one should have a credence of one. So for instance, like your total evidence decisively supports the proposition. Like there's no way in principle for the proposition to be false given your total evidence. And here after all, I'll just be talking about the psychological sense of certainty, by the way. And note that many of these categorizations of belief knowledge, credence, and certainty cross-cut one another. So do not confuse them. So often people confuse these sorts of things. So I've put together this little table here. This is for some proposition P. So for instance, snow is white, or God exists, or Bigfoot exists, or one plus one equals 18, etc. And on this side, I've got belief, knowledge, credence, and certainty. And I've also got no belief, no knowledge, no credence, and no certainty up here. So let's just go through. Can someone believe P, but also not believe P? Well, probably not. <laughs> Can someone believe that P, but not know that P? Well, yeah, definitely. People believe things all the time that they don't know. You can believe something, but be mistaken in believing it. And of course, since truth is required for knowledge, they're not going to have knowledge. Moreover, someone can believe something without being appropriately justified in believing it. So even if their belief is true, they're not going to count as knowing it. Moreover, they could have a justified true belief and yet not have knowledge. Because again, remember that ungettier condition. You also need to meet that in order to have knowledge. A very easy example of a Gettier case, by the way, is just a clock that very recently broke, but through no fault of their own, some person doesn't know that the clock very recently broke. Someone looks at the clock, glances at it, forms a belief on the basis of what the clock says that the time is, say, 3.02. As it happens, the clock has been broken since 3.02 a.m. last night. But also as it happens, it's currently 3.02 p.m. So the person's belief that it's 3.02 p.m. is true. They believe it. And they're actually quite justified in believing it. I mean, this clock, we can suppose that they've had it for quite a while. It's never failed on them. They have no reason to suspect that it's broken. It worked yesterday. They haven't looked at it at all today since right now, etc. So they have a justified true belief, but they don't actually know that it's 302. Can someone believe that something and not have any credence whatsoever in it? That's actually debatable, and we're not going to get into the debates there. Can someone believe something and have no certainty in it? Well, yeah, of course. I believe, for instance, that it's going to rain tonight. There is a 95% chance of that according to my weather app. But... I'm not absolutely certain that it's going to rain tonight, but I do believe it. I'm preparing for it. I'm going to bring, let's say, an umbrella to when I work out, etc. Okay, knowledge. Can someone have knowledge but no belief? Plausibly not. We saw that knowledge probably requires belief. Can someone have knowledge that P but no knowledge that P? That doesn't seem to make much sense. Can someone have knowledge that P but no credence that P? Well, again, that's going to be debatable because knowledge requires belief, and it was debatable that belief required credence. Can someone know something but not have certainty in it? Well, yeah, again, very plausibly. I believe tonight that it's going to rain. 
on the basis of the 95% chance that the weather app says, that belief is likely justified. I'm plausibly not in a Gettier case. And we can suppose that it really is going to rain tonight. Like, that is a true proposition. In that case, of course I know it's going to rain tonight, even though I'm not absolutely certain. Similarly, I know that one of my best friends exists because I talked to him yesterday, but I'm not absolutely certain that he exists. Maybe because in the last 20 seconds he was hit by a meteor, or maybe he was hit by a car or something. Like, I can't rule those out with absolute certainty, but come on, I know that my friend exists. I talked to him yesterday. So do not think that knowledge requires certainty. What about credence? Can you have a credence in something and no belief? Well, yes, of course. I have some level of credence, namely 0%, in the proposition that 1 plus 1 equals 7, but I don't believe it. And moreover, I have some level of credence that it's not going to rain tonight. 5% credence, but I don't believe it. Can you have credence but not knowledge? Well, yes, of course. Those cases that I just gave were examples. Can you have credence but no credence? No, probably not. Can you have credence but no certainty? Yes, again, those examples that I just gave were examples of that. Can you have certainty without belief? I'm going to say probably not. If you're absolutely certain that something is true, surely you believe it. <laughs> that seems quite plausible. Can you be absolutely certain in something and yet not know it? Yeah, of course. People are absolutely certain in falsehoods all the time. They're absolutely certain in things for which they lack justification. And moreover, someone might be unjustifiably absolutely certain that it's 3.02 p.m. in the Gettier case that I mentioned. So people can be certain even though they don't have knowledge. Can you have certainty but no credence? I don't think so. Certainty is just a level of credence of 100%. Can you have certainty but no certainty? Of course not. So anyway, my point is just that these various things cross-cut. Don't confuse belief with knowledge. Don't confuse belief with conf levels of confidence. Don't confuse levels of confidence with certainty. Don't confuse certainty with knowledge, and don't think that knowledge requires certainty. There is so much lack of clarity on these things in the internet sphere that I'm just really hoping that this sort of thing that I'm presenting here can diffuse that unclarity and confusion. Okay, so that's the first mistake. What about mistake number two? Faith is believing with no evidence, or with evidence insufficient for rational belief. Sometimes you'll hear this said, that faith is believing what you know ain't so. Faith is like somehow disingenuous like that. Believing what you know ain't so. So you know that it's not the case. And since knowledge requires belief, you believe that it's not the case. But somehow you also believe that it is the case. Like, what? Like, what? <laughs> but anyway, there's this huge mantra on the internet sphere that faith is believing with no evidence. But that is a mistake. I don't know of a single contemporary philosopher, whether theist or non-theist, who thinks this is even a remotely serious attempt at capturing what faith really involves. Faith, in short, is a trusting commitment to someone or something. This trusting commitment will plausibly involve at least two components. The first is a cognitive component. This could simply be a belief, but it might be something weaker but still belief-like. For example, at least some level of confidence, or at least some credence that the object of faith is true, or exists, or will occur, etc. So, for example, if you have faith that your friend will win their upcoming basketball game, you'll think there's at least a not absurdly low chance that they win. Like, it doesn't make sense to have faith that your friend's team will win if you're totally convinced that they're definitely going to get crushed. The second component of faith is a conative or desire-like component. This will involve something like a desire for, or a positive evaluation of, or hope for, its object. That is the object of faith, the thing that one has faith in. Returning to our example above, if you have faith that your friend will win their upcoming game, then you want them to win the game, or you regard that as a good outcome, you sort of desire that, or you hope that they win. So faith is a trusting commitment to someone or something which involves a belief-like component and a desire-like component. So that's just a brief rendering of a relatively popular and plausible account of faith. And notice that it's quite clearly compatible with believing on the basis of evidence, and indeed with believing on the basis of evidence sufficient to render the belief rational. I mean, just recently, I kid you not, my dad told me that he would get home with a car by noon so that I could leave for my physical therapy appointment for my torn ACL. Well, it was torn. Now I've got my patellar tendon where the previous ACL was. Okay, anyway. Now, I had ample evidence that he would fulfill his promise. My dad has done this a number of times in the past. He's always come through. He's a very reliable man, etc. And indeed, this ample evidence was enough to make it rational to believe that he'd get home by noon. But I still had to have faith that he would pull through. And indeed, as I sat there, anxiously waiting at 11.58 a.m., there he was, pulling up into the driveway. So anyway, very plausibly, faith is indeed compatible with believing on the basis of evidence, and indeed with believing on the basis of evidence sufficient to render the belief rational. So please stop saying that faith is believing what you know ain't so. Please stop saying that faith is believing with no evidence. And indeed, please stop saying that faith is believing with evidence insufficient for rational belief. Of course, right, some people which have faith in things are such that those people don't have evidence for their faith and don't have sufficient evidence for rendering that faith rational. My point is just that faith is not by definition these sorts of things. And one who has faith need not be like that. That's my sole point. I'm not saying everyone who has faith thereby has evidence sufficient for rational belief. My point is just that 
faith is not identical to and does not even require believing with no evidence or believing with evidence insufficient for rational belief. All right, on to mistake number three, confusing sentences, beliefs, and propositions. I've seen this confusion quite a lot, and Michael Humer is going to help dispel with the confusion from his book Knowledge, Reality, and Value, which I highly recommend you check out. So sentences are sequences of words, like what you're looking at right now. Not all sentences can be true or false. For example, questions or commands cannot be. Only assertive sentences or declarative sentences or proposition expressing sentences can be true or false. For instance, the sentence, it is raining, is true or false. The question, is it raining, or the command, make it rain, are not. Beliefs, by contrast, are a kind of mental state, a state of thinking something to be the case. They're typically expressed by using assertive or declarative sentences. They need not actually be expressed, though. You could just think silently to yourself that it is raining. Uh, the thought must either be true or false. And this contrasts with, for example, emotions, desires, or sensations, which are neither true nor false. Propositions, by contrast, are the sort of things that beliefs and statements are about. When you have a belief, there is something that you believe to be the case. When you make an assertion, there is something that you are asserting to be the case. That thing is a proposition. A proposition should not be confused with a belief, since the proposition is the thing that one believes, not the belief itself. The same proposition can be believed by one person and doubted by another. One person may believe that we will colonize Mars, while someone else might merely hope that we will, and a third can doubt that we will, and a fourth is glad that we will, and so on. In this case, these different attitudes, these different propositional attitudes, would all be attitudes toward the same proposition. And so the proposition isn't identical to any one of these individual propositional attitudes. And again, the proposition is what is denoted by or expressed by the phrase that we will colonize Mars. Right. A proposition also should not be confused with a sentence or phrase in a particular language. The proposition is not the phrase that we will colonize Mars, like these little ink marks on this page. Instead, it is the thing that the phrase refers to. Right. I mean, like, don't, don't confuse the Eiffel Tower with the expression, the English expression on the page here, these little markings, the Eiffel Tower. Right. The tower is the referent of that expression. In other words, it's what that expression refers to or picks out in the world, denotes. The sentences, snow is white, and schnee ist weiss have something in common. And they're obviously not the same sentence, right, because they're in different languages, but they do say the same thing. That is, they express the same proposition, namely that snow is white. Okay, so those are all some pretty basic epistemology mistakes that I wanted to cover and get out of the way first before we get on to probability, evidence, and Bayesianism. Bayesianism, 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 little toy Bayesian models of everything. I'm sorry, I should not pepper these things with inside jokes. Well, is that really an inside joke? I mean, it, there's a YouTube video about it anyway. Mistake number four, overlooking the polysemy of probability. Polysemy, poly means many. Semi means meanings. So many meanings of the word probability. So many times on the internets, I see people use the term probability in arguments and discussions and so on. Very often people are talking past one another when that happens. They, they confuse or equate different distinct understandings of probability within their arguments. They'll overlook certain accounts of probability which are plausible and on which some of their premises come out as false. So anyway, do not overlook the polysemy of probability. Whenever you're talking about probability, I'd recommend explicitly stating what you mean by it so that there's a consistent usage throughout your conversation with your dialectical partner. Otherwise, it's a recipe for confusion. My sense is that most philosophers think that probability is just multiply ambiguous, and English just has various different notions of probability that are distinct from one another, and none of them like accurately captures all probability talk. It's just sometimes we're talk using pro the term probability to refer to one notion, sometimes we're using probability talk to refer to another notion, etc. So sometimes probability means propensity. Like one understanding treats probabilities as objective tendencies or propensities for certain outcomes. Propensities are roughly like degrees of causal influence, like different sets of causal factors have stronger or weaker tendencies to produce certain outcomes, and probabilities will measure the strength of those tendencies or propensities. Another understanding of probability treats probabilities as frequencies of certain outcomes or events under such and such conditions where those frequencies can be understood. So this, this account itself, this notion of probability in terms of frequency can itself be broken down into actual frequency and hypothetical frequency. So the actual frequency of an event is the actual frequency with which it occurs, like 50% of the actual coin tosses, whereas the hypothetical frequency is the frequency with which the outcome would occur if the relevant conditions were repeated many times. So like if I were to flip this coin many, 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 many times, perhaps even infinitely many times, it would be the case that the frequency of heads is 50%, even though perhaps for some actual frequencies and actual coins, they only, f you know, they're only flipped a thousand and one times, and it's not possible to get exactly 50% of the coin tosses there to land heads. So you've got propensity, we've got frequency. Another understanding 
treats probabilities as an agent's actual credences or their actual levels of confidence. On this understanding, probability is relative to an agent, right? You can only ever talk about an agent's probability for a given proposition. That's just basically just how confident they are in a proposition. A related understanding treats probability as rational credences. That is the credence that an agent should have in a proposition in light of their evidence, or perhaps in light of a restricted set of facts. A still further understanding treats probabilities as mind-independent degreed relations of support between propositions which determine which credences are rational, but are not themselves credences, or what are sometimes called degrees of belief. Yet another understanding of probability, which is admittedly very closely related to the rational credence account, treats probability as a measure of the degree of justification that a proposition has in light of one's current evidence. A proposition has probability one in this understanding of probability, if and only if we have conclusive justification for believing it which is the strongest justification possible. This applies to at most very few propositions, such as perhaps a proposition that something exists or the proposition that two is less than three. A proposition has probability zero for us under this account, if and only if we have conclusive justification for denying it. Generally speaking, under this account, the only propositions with probability zero are gonna be those that are contradictory or otherwise absurd. And there are many more notions of probability besides. So just be very careful, know that the term probability is multiply ambiguous between concepts like propensity, frequency, actual frequency, hypothetical frequency, an agent's actual credence or level of confidence in something, an agent's rational credence in something, degrees of support between propositions, degrees of justification between propositions and bodies of evidence, etc. And as I said, there are more accounts of probability besides. Okay, so that's mistake number four. Mistakes number five through 10, I'm going to be very brief about them because I've already covered all of them extensively in my video, A User's Guide to Bayes Theorem. But you guys should definitely be aware of these mistakes. So mistake number five is confusing evidence for H, where H is some hypothesis, with making H probable, right? Just because you've pinpointed some evidence for hypothesis, that doesn't mean you've made the hypothesis, all things considered, more probably true than false. No, sometimes you can provide evidence for a hypothesis and that just boosts it from a 1% chance of being true to a 2% chance of being true. You've increased its probability, right? You've supported it, you've provided evidence for it, but you certainly haven't made it probable. So don't confuse evidence for H with making H probable. And by the way, also don't make confusions about the nature of evidence. As philosophers generally understand it, some piece of data is evidence for a hypothesis when that data is more expected or more likely on the supposition that that hypothesis is true, then it is on the assumption that that hypothesis is false. So again, some piece of data is evidence for hypothesis H, just in case the probability of that data conditional on H is greater than the probability of that data conditional on the negation of H, that is conditional on H being false. In other words, the truth of H better predicts the data than the falsity of H. H leads us to expect the data more than the falsity of H. Okay, mistake number six, ignoring the total evidence requirement. Whenever you're trying to assess the overall merits of a hypothesis and whether it's true, all things considered, you should not solely be looking at a restricted set of data. In order to make an all things considered judgment about the probability of hypothesis, say the probability of God's existence, and in trying to decide whether or not God exists, you cannot ignore the total range of evidence bearing on the question. What this looks like sometimes is that people will look at the fine tuning argument, say, and they'll conclude that fine tuning is evidence for theism. But sometimes then they'll go on to say that, therefore, theism is probably true. Now, we've already seen how you can't infer merely from the fact that something is evidence for hypothesis that, therefore, the hypothesis is more probably true than false. So keep that in mind. But also, even if we could show that a hypothesis conditional on some particular piece of evidence is more likely true than false, in order to determine whether that hypothesis is all things considered more likely true than false, you'd have to take into account all the evidence bearing on the relevant hypothesis, not just the particular piece of evidence in question. So that's yet another mistake for that kind of reasoning, the fine-tuning reasoning that I was just mentioning earlier. I'm not saying that this is a problem for the fine-tuning argument in general. I'm just saying this is a problem for how some people on the internet wield the fine-tuning argument. Again, philosophers are much more careful about this, at least some are. So in short, when you're trying to assess the epistemic merits of a hypothesis, take into account all the relevant evidence bearing on that hypothesis. Don't take into account solely a restricted set of evidence. Okay, mistake number seven, understating the evidence. Very often, people will pinpoint some general fact which favors some hypothesis, but they'll then all too conveniently overlook more specific facts, which conditional on the general fact obtaining are far more likely on the negation of the relevant hypothesis. So although the hypothesis predicts the general fact better than the negation of the hypothesis, there are various more specific facts about that general fact, which actually are predicted much better by the negation of the hypothesis 
together with the general fact obtaining. Just beware when someone cites some general piece of evidence and overlooks more specific facts about that evidence, which actually tell against the hypothesis the person is wielding the general evidence on behalf of. Okay, mistake number eight, ignoring the comparative nature of Bayesian confirmation. In short, in order for some piece of data to confirm a hypothesis or to make it more probable or to serve as evidence for that hypothesis, all you need for that is that that piece of data is more expected on the hypothesis than it is on the negation of that hypothesis. You don't need the data to be all things considered likely to obtain on the first hypothesis. You don't need that in order for that data to serve as evidence for the hypothesis. Just keep that in mind. And that's because Bayesian confirmation is comparative. You're comparing a hypothesis and how well it predicts the data with another hypothesis. And so long as the first hypothesis predicts the data better than the second hypothesis, the data is going to serve as evidence for the former hypothesis, even if that data is unlikely on the first hypothesis. Mistake number nine, evidential symmetry. So people will very often think that some piece of data would be evidence for a hypothesis, but somehow they think that the failure of that data to obtain would not be evidence against the hypothesis. And that's just mistaken. No. If some piece of data is evidence for a hypothesis, then that data not obtaining would be evidence against that hypothesis. You can just straightforwardly prove that with Bayes' theorem. So, for instance, if you think that literally every single professing Christian being noticeably morally superior to every non-Christian, if you think that that would be some pretty powerful evidence for Christianity, as it plausibly would, well, then the fact that we don't witness that is some evidence against Christianity. That doesn't mean, of course, that it's as strong evidence, right? But it does mean that it's evidence. Okay, mistake number 10, likelihood ratio rigging. This basically happens when someone bakes in something to their hypothesis, which does lead us to very strongly expect some piece of data. But they only purchase that predictive power by sort of correspondingly lowering the intrinsic or prior probability of their hypothesis. In that case, you haven't actually made any overall probabilistic headway in sort of boosting the epistemic credentials of your hypothesis. Now, again, I know I said intrinsic or prior probability. I recognize that those are distinct. I talk about this in my Bayes' theorem video. But anyway, people, check out for these six mistakes the user's guide to Bayes' theorem video. The end of it for more. I go through these common mistakes. All right, on to mistake number 11, which is confirmation closure under entailment. Now, that sounds immensely complicated, but it's not actually that complicated, okay? It's a mistake to think that confirmation or evidential support transmits over entailment. In other words, here's the mistake. If E is evidence for or confirms H1, and H1 entails H2, well, then E is evidence for H2. That's not true. Now, you might think that that's a natural thought. Well, hold on a second. Like, if one hypothesis entails another, then anything that's evidence for the first hypothesis must be evidence for the second hypothesis. After all, the first hypothesis entails the second hypothesis. So if you're supporting the first hypothesis, don't you also support the second hypothesis? It's a natural thought but it turns out to be mistaken. So here's one way that you can see how it's not the case that if E is evidence for H1 and H1 entails H2, then it follows that E is evidence for H2. Suppose that I have a machine, a gumball machine, which randomly spits out a red gumball 50% of the time and a white gumball the other 50% of the time. And suppose further that its outputs are probabilistically independent over time. It's always a 50% chance of a red gumball and always a 50% chance of a white gumball. Now, suppose the machine spits out a first ball, B1, and then a second ball, B2. And now we're going to be constructing some theories about balls. So suppose you have a favored theory that both balls are red. And suppose that I have a favored theory that the second ball, B2, is red, while the first ball, B1, is white. Now suppose we look at B2 without looking at B1. And we see that B2 is red. Now call this data that B2 is red, call that data D. Okay? So we've got balls and we've got a D. We've now acquired evidence for each of our theories. Since each of our theories entails D, right? Each of our theories entails that B2 is red, right? My theory is that B2 is red while B1 is white, so my theory entails D. And your theory is that both balls are red, so your theory also entails D. And moreover, the negations of each of our theories do not entail D, right? If it's not the case that B2 is red and B1 is white, what that's saying is that that's just a big disjunction over the various other permutations of ball colors. And not all of those involve the second ball being red. And so what that means is that the negation of my hypothesis does not entail that B2 is red, and neither does the negation of your hypothesis. And what that means is that the probability of D conditional on my hypothesis is one, right? Because my hypothesis entails D, whereas the probability of D conditional on the negation of my hypothesis is not one. Because again, the negation of my hypothesis does not entail D. Some of the disjuncts within the negation of my hypothesis 
which take up some of the probability space, do not involve B2 being red. And so the probability of D, that is the probability that B2 is red, conditional on the negation of my hypothesis, is not 1. It's not 100%. And the same point holds for your hypothesis and the negation of your hypothesis. So then, D confirms your theory, right? D is evidence for your theory, because D is more expected on your theory than the negation of your theory. And D also confirms my theory, right? So D is evidence for my theory, because it's more expected on my theory than on the negation of my theory. But the proposition that B1 is white is entailed by my theory, and the proposition that B1 is red is entailed by your theory. So if confirmation were closed under entailment, it would follow that D would confirm both propositions, namely the proposition that B1 is white and the proposition that B1 is red. Right? We just found out that D confirms your theory, D is evidence for your theory, and your theory entails that B1 is red. So if confirmation were closed under entailment in this way, if this principle up here were true, well, then it would follow that D would be evidence that B1 is red. But similarly, right, remember, D confirms my theory. It's evidence for my theory. And my theory entails that B1 is white, not red. And so if this principle up here were true, D would be evidence that B2 is white, not red. So if this principle up here were true, then D would confirm both the claim that B1 is white and the claim that B1 is red. But that can't be right for several reasons. That, that's absurd. Uh, and you could just, you could prove that that's absurd. So here are some reasons for thinking it's absurd to claim that D confirms both the proposition that B1 is white and the proposition that B1 is red. And so for starters, neither of those propositions, neither the proposition that B1 is white nor the proposition that B1 is red, predict D better than the other, right? Recall D, right? It's the claim that B2 is red. The probability of that data conditional on B1 being white is just equal to the probability of that data conditional on B1 being red. Right? This just follows from the probabilistic independence of the machine's outputs. Right? The machine's results on previous outputs don't affect the machine's results on future outputs. So the probability that B2 is red, the probability, in other words, that the second ball that it outputs is red, is the same regardless of whether or not B1 is white or red. Right? That doesn't make any difference. So the probability of D conditional on B1 being white is equal to the probability of D conditional on B1 being red. And that just follows from the probabilistic independence of the machine's outputs. So assuming that the proposition B1 is white and the proposition that B1 is red are exclusive, right? They can't both be true. They exclude one another, as we are supposing. And moreover, supposing that they're exhaustive, as we're supposing, right? These are the only, like, we're supposing that these are the only outputs that the machine could have. It's either a white ball and only a white ball or a red ball and only a red ball on any given output. So these things are exclusive. They can't both happen. And they're exhaustive of the relevant possibilities. One or the other must happen on the given occasion. So because they are exclusive and exhaustive, we can treat them as one being a hypothesis and the other being the negation of that hypothesis, right? And so we have a case of the probability of some data conditional on a hypothesis, where H is the proposition that B1 is white, is equal to the probability of that data conditional on the negation of that hypothesis, which again, the, the functional equivalent of the negation of B1 being white is B1 being red, right? Because that's the only alternative to B1 being white, and there must be some alternative given the, given the setup. So if it's not the case that B1 is white, then it's going to have to be the case that B1 is red. And similarly, if it's not the case that B1 is red, then it's going to have to be the case that B1 is white. So these two we can treat as the negations of one another. And so we here have a case, as I just showed, right? Probability of D given B1 is white is the same as the probability of D given that B1 is red. And given the stipulations involved in the scenario as I set it up, these two hypotheses here are the negations of one another. So we here have a case where some data is equally expected under a hypothesis and under the negation of that hypothesis. But whenever that happens, that piece of data does not confirm either of those hypotheses, either H or not H, because it's just as expected under the respective hypotheses, right? It's not better predicted by one of them over the other, and so it doesn't confirm either of them. So it follows that D doesn't confirm both B1 is white and B2 is red. And that contradicts what we showed up here, that D would confirm both B1 is white and B1 is red if confirmation were closed under entailment. That is, if this principle up here were true. So the overarching argument here is that if this general principle were true, well then in the scenario that I constructed, D would be evidence for both the claim that B1 is white and the claim that B1 is red. But it's not the case that D is evidence both for the claim that B1 is white and B1 is red, as I just explained here. And so this principle up here is false. I'm sorry, this part of this video is probably the most technical portion of this entire seven part series. So just bear with me, I'm trying to explain it as best as I can, but I understand that this may be a little bit difficult to follow. I am trying my hardest though.
I also give another reason here for why it's not the case that D can confirm B1 is white and B1 is red, but we don't need to go through that second reason here because it's just access to requirement. What we learn from the proceeding is that confirmation is not closed under entailment. In other words, just because some hypothesis entails a second hypothesis and some piece of data is evidence for the first hypothesis, it actually doesn't follow from that, that that piece of data is evidence for the second hypothesis. So here's why this is relevant. I mean, this sometimes, I mean, this comes up very often. <laughs> You'd be surprised. But this sometimes comes up when someone assumes that if evidence E confirms Christianity, then it must confirm theism because Christianity entails theism. But that's not necessarily true, right? I mean, E could be the statement that Islam is false. In learning only that Islam is false, we actually decrease the probability of theism on the whole, right? Because Islam is one way for theism to be true. So we're, take, we're sort of removing one way for theism to be true. So theism is going to occupy less of the probability space in total. But importantly, we actually increase the probability of Christianity, right? Because taking out the portion of the probability space in which Islam is true, right? Because we're taking that out because we're supposing that we learn that it's false. So we're kind of erasing that, we're taking that out of the probability space, and then we have to renormalize, as it were, but, but don't worry about that. When we take out Islam's portion of the probability space, Christianity doesn't get any of its probability space removed, and it's now going to be occupying a greater proportion of the probability space. So we have some piece of evidence here in this model for Christianity, and yet it doesn't actually confirm theism. It's actually evidence against theism, even though Christianity entails theism, right? So just because you pinpoint some evidence for Christianity. And just because Christianity entails theism, that doesn't mean that you have evidence for theism on our hands. And then here's another example that I'm not going to get into of the failure of confirmation closure. So in short, the general lesson here is that merely from the fact that E is evidence for some hypothesis, and that hypothesis entails a second hypothesis, it doesn't follow that E is evidence for that second hypothesis. This will also come up in a later part of the series when we talk about the problem of evil. And that brings us to our 12th mistake, which is that if P entails Q, it doesn't follow that evidence against Q is evidence against P, right? So if Christianity entails theism and you have some evidence against theism, it doesn't automatically follow that that's evidence against Christianity. And to see that, notice that this is actually just an instance of confirmation closure, right? When P entails Q, that's just equivalent to saying not Q, so the negation of Q, the falsity of Q, entails not P. And right, something is evidence against Q just in case it's evidence for the negation of Q, right? If you have evidence against the hypothesis, that's evidence for the falsity of that hypothesis or for the negation of that hypothesis. So up here, what we're saying then is that if not Q entails not P, it doesn't follow that evidence for the negation of Q is evidence for the negation of P. And that's just pointing out that confirmation is actually not closed under entailment, which we just covered above. And again, notice how natural this sort of reasoning might seem at first glance. Christianity entails the existence of God, so any evidence against the existence of God is evidence against Christianity. That natural thought is mistaken. Of course, since Christianity entails the existence of God, the probability of Christianity can never exceed the probability of the existence of God, but that's about it, right? The probability of theism can go down even though the probability of Christianity stays the same or goes up. And again, I already gave an example of that. Learning that Islam is false would decrease the probability of theism, although it would actually increase the probability of Christianity, despite the fact that Christianity entails theism. So even though Christianity entails theism, and even though one has pinpointed some evidence against theism, it does not automatically follow that that's evidence against Christianity. I also give another example of this. It's like a pretty simple case. Like we have, suppose we have three distinct possibilities, A, B, and C. Now, A entails a or B, right? Whenever you have a, a, a claim, that claim entails the disjunction of that claim and some any other claim, whatever. Now suppose that we falsify B. We show that B is false. Now, B's falsification is clearly evidence against the disjunction of A or B, right? Like you've removed one way for this thing to be false, and so you've decreased the probability of this overall disjunction. So B's falsification is evidence against A or B. But B's falsification is actually not thereby evidence against a, right? In fact, quite the contrary, right? B's falsification is actually evidence for A. We initially have three distinct possibilities, A, B, and C. We can suppose that they're each one-third probable initially. If you falsify B and remove it, well, then only two possibilities remain, and A is going to then have to be boosted to 50% probability, and C is going to be boosted to 50% probability. So actually, B's falsification is evidence for A. It raised its probability from a mere 33.3% to 50%. So notice what we have here. A entails A or B. And we found some piece of data, namely B's being false. And that piece of data is evidence against A or B. 
But it's not evidence against A. In fact, it's evidence for A, even though A entails A or B. Right, so we have a case where one hypothesis entails another hypothesis, and we pinpointed evidence against that second hypothesis. It doesn't follow that that's evidence against the first hypothesis. So again, just because P entails Q, it doesn't follow that evidence against Q, evidence against the second hypothesis, is thereby evidence against the first hypothesis. Okay, mistake number 13. Some piece of data D cannot be evidence for multiple incompatible hypotheses. Wrong. Yes, it can. I actually already gave an example of that, right? Remember, learning that ball B2 was red was evidence for both my hypothesis and yours, right? Your hypothesis was that both balls were red, and my hypothesis was that B2 was red while B1 was white. And remember, I explained how B2's being red was evidence for both of our hypotheses even though our hypotheses were incompatible, right? And other examples are pretty easy to come by as well. So here's a pretty easy example of some piece of data being evidence for multiple incompatible hypotheses. A card is picked at random from a deck of shuffled cards. They were shuffled fairly, etc. Now suppose you learn somehow that the card is red. It's a red suit. That is clearly evidence that the card is a diamond, and it's also evidence that the card is a heart. Right? Initially, the probability that it's a heart is one-fourth. The probability that it's a diamond is also one-fourth. But upon learning that the card is red, that's a piece of data, the probability of those hypotheses get boosted. They get boosted to one-half for each hypothesis. So that is evidence for those views. It supports them. It raises their probability. It makes them more likely. It gives them a probabilistic boost. And yet, those hypotheses are incompatible with one another. The card can't be both a heart and a diamond. So it's just painfully false to say that some piece of data cannot be evidence for multiple incompatible hypotheses. Yes, it can. All right, mistake number 14, confirmation transitivity. So it's tempting to believe that confirmation is transitive. In other words, if A is evidence for B, or if A confirms B, and if B is evidence for C, well, then A is evidence for C. But, again, that's a mistake. Confirmation is not, in general, transitive. So here's, a, here's an example of confirmation transitivity failure. Suppose our background knowledge here is the fact that a card has just been selected at random from a standard 52 card deck. Now consider these three propositions. A, the card is a jack. B, the card is the jack of spades. And C, the card is a spade. Now, relative to our background, A, would confirm B, right? If we found out that the card is a jack, that would significantly raise the probability that the card is the jack of spades, specifically. And decidedly, the probability that the card is the jack of spades is one out of 52. But if we found out that the card is a jack, that boosts the probability that the card is specifically the jack of spades up to one in four. So A is significant evidence for B. And, moreover, relative to our background, B would clearly confirm C, right? If you found out that the card is a jack of spades, that would certainly be strong evidence for the card being a spade. In fact, it entails that the card is a spade. So again, antecedently, the card being a spade, that's going to be a 1 in 4 chance. But if you found out that the card is a jack of spades, that actually brings up the probability of this to 100%. So it, gets, it gives it a boost in probability. So B is evidence for C. So we got here, A would be evidence for B, B would be evidence for C, but we can ask, would A be evidence for C? No, not at all. Not at all, mate. Right, relative to the background that a card was picked from a fair deck, A does nothing to support conclusion C, right? Merely from the fact that the card is a jack, that doesn't make it any more likely that the card is a spade, right? Initially, there are four suits, right? And spade is one of the suits. So there's a one in four chance that the card is a spade. Well, now suppose that you learn that the card is a jack, specifically. Does that make it any more probable that the card is a spade? No, it's still a one in four chance. Because again, there are only four jacks in the deck, and only one of them is a spade. So there's still a one-fourth chance that the card is a spade. So A is not evidence for C. So notice what we have here. A is evidence for B. B is evidence for C. But A is not evidence for C. And what that shows is that confirmation is not, in general, transitive. You cannot infer merely from the fact that A is evidence for B and B is evidence for C that A is evidence for C. And moreover, this is also a counterexample, by the way, to the principle that if A is evidence for B and B entails C, then A is evidence for C, which was the mistake of confirmation closure that we covered previously, right? Because here we have a case of B entailing C, and we have a case of A being evidence for B, and yet A is not evidence for C. So we have yet another counterexample to confirmation closure that we covered earlier. All right, on to mistake number 15. So this mistake is thinking that if D entails D star, 
and D star is evidence for H, well then D must be evidence for H or couldn't be evidence against H. So some people think that like, so hey, there being like an evolutionary process where there's suffering entails that the universe was fine-tuned, right? That's a requirement. And the universe is fine-tuned, well, that's evidence for theism. And so actually, this protracted evolutionary process of animal suffering, D, must be some evidence for theism. No, no. And then, or they might think that it couldn't be evidence against theism. No, that's just, that's just wrong. Please, stop. Again, we're going to cover this later on in the series, but I've seen lots of people make this mistake. They'll be like, well, in order for there to be suffering, there has to be a finely tuned universe, and that's evidence for theism. So actually, suffering isn't evidence against theism. That doesn't follow, okay? That's straightforwardly, probabilistically fallacious. Here's an example which shows that it's not the case that if D entails D star and D star is evidence for H, well then D must be evidence for H, or couldn't be evidence against H. So let D be the claim that some minded being knows that God doesn't exist. And let D star be the claim that there is at least one mind. Finally, let H, the hypothesis, be that God, a divine mind, exists. Clearly here, D entails D star, right? If some minded being knows that God doesn't exist, well then clearly there's at least one mind. So D entails D star. Equally clearly, D star is evidence for H, right? The fact that there is at least one mind is evidence that God, a divine mind, exists. And the reason for that is relatively simple. It's that H entails D star, the claim that God, a divine mind, exists. That clearly entails that there is at least one mind. So H entails D star, but the negation of H actually doesn't entail D star, right? The claim that God, a divine mind, doesn't exist, that doesn't entail that there's at least one mind. That's compatible with there being no minds, just like a totally mindless reality. And from that, it follows that the probability of D star given H is actually greater than the probability of D star given not H. And so D star is more expected under H than it is under the negation of H, and so D star is evidence for H. So look, I just showed that D entails D star, and D star is evidence for H, but I'm going to go on to explain how it doesn't follow that D is evidence for H. So clearly I say D is not evidence for H. In fact, D is incompatible with H, right? Some minded being knows that God doesn't exist. That's certainly not evidence for God's existence. In fact, this is incompatible with God's existence, because if some minded being knows that God doesn't exist, it just follows that God doesn't exist. And so it can't provide evidence for it. As I say here, it would provide decisive evidence against it. So what that shows is that here we have a case where D entails D star, and D star is evidence for H, but yet it clearly is not true that D is evidence for H. And moreover, it's also clearly not true that D couldn't then be evidence against H. Again, people often make this mistake in the problem of evil. An atheist will say something like, horrific suffering is evidence against God's existence. And I've heard some theists retort that the existence of horrific suffering entails the existence of a universe that must be finely tuned for conscious living creatures, and that since the latter is evidence for God's existence, the former couldn't be evidence against God's existence. And that's just mathematically incorrect, and demonstrably so. Or, you know, they'll say something, you know, the, the atheist will say something like, um, well, horrific suffering is evidence of God's, against God's existence, and they'll give some argument for thinking that that's the case. But the theist will be like, creatures that can suffer are contingent creatures. And, you know, contingency is evidence for theism. So actually, you haven't even pinpointed some evidence against God's existence. That's no, that doesn't follow. Horrific suffering can still be evidence against God's existence, even though horrific suffering entails something else, which is evidence for God's existence. Okay, so that's mistake number 14. Mistake number 15, mistakes surrounding the slogan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Oh, by the way, we're out of the shark infested waters of probability theory. So to those of you who kind of zoned out during that. You can zone back in now because it's going to be more comprehensible from, from now on, uh, or at least I hope so. <laughs> so yeah, no, it will be. But anyway, I had to cover these important probabilistic mistakes that I see time and time again. So apologies about that. And I'm realizing that I now have two mistake number 15s. <laughs> so to fix that, I'm just going to turn mistake number 12 into mistake 11 extended. So that's what we're going to do. Mistake number 11 extended. And then this is going to have to be mistake number 12, and mistake number 13, mistake number 14. So mistake number 15, which is really a collection of mistakes surrounding the slogan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So I'm just going to be honest. I've seen basically everyone make a mess of this one. Let me just say that probably the best way to interpret the slogan is just an instance of Bayes' theorem. Extraordinary claims are those with a very low prior probability. In other words, Prior to looking at the evidence, and in light of our background knowledge, the claims appear very unlikely to be true. And extraordinary evidence is just evidence that's powerful enough to overcome a very low prior probability and render the relevant claims believable. Within this understanding, it is true that extraordinary claims, if we are to be rational in believing them, require extraordinary evidence. 
since claims with a very low prior probability need significant evidence in their favor in order to overcome their low initial prior probability. That, I think, is how the slogan should be understood. And pretty much any other understanding that I've come across is either confused or mistaken. So we should all stop debating about this principle and just recognize that there's pretty much one and only one correct way to understand it. And when we understand it that way, it's perfectly innocuous and perfectly true. And it's a useful principle. It's a OK. It's not going to bite you. It's not going to harm you. It's not under your bed or in your closet. Is it in the room with us right now? Anyway. Let's stop making these mistakes surrounding the slogan, because this is the best interpretation of it, and it's a true interpretation, okay? Okay, fine, some people will use other interpretations, it'll be mistaken, and we have to correct them, etc., but that's the purpose of my mistake number 15. Okay, mistake number 16. X is improbable by chance, therefore, X is evidence for God. That doesn't follow. You would also need to show that X is actually more probable under theism than x is under chance. And I honestly don't know what under chance means. Uh, do they mean under atheism? Why are they equating atheism with chance? Do they mean under naturalism? Why are they equating naturalism with chance? What even is chance in this context? But anyway, in order to show that x is evidence for theism, you need to show that it's more probable under theism than it is under atheism. It's not enough then to just say that it's very improbable by chance or that it's very improbable under atheism. You need to show that it's not also very improbable under theism, and in fact it's more probable under theism than it is under atheism. And of course you'd also need to do this without rigging the likelihood ratio, which punts back to a previous mistake. All right, mistake number 17, claims aren't evidence. Oh boy, uh, so as it stands, this slogan is, is pretty unclear. Now, I think a claim that best approximates what people are trying to express with this slogan is the following claim. The mere fact that somebody claims that P does not provide evidence for P's truth. I think that's what we were saying when they're saying claims aren't evidence. The mere fact that somebody claims that P does not provide evidence for P's truth. Now, understood that way, that I mean, this is just, this the slogan here is just clearly false. Very often the fact that someone claims that P is evidence for the truth of P. There is such a thing as testimonial evidence after all, namely evidence that you get for the truth of a proposition from the fact that somebody testified to the truth of the proposition, that is, told you that the claim is true. For instance, my friend claimed that he bought a new soccer ball, and this provides pretty strong evidence that he did, in fact, buy a soccer ball. And we can also explain why this is often true with the help of Bayesianism. The data here is that my friend claimed that he bought a new soccer ball, and we have two competing hypotheses, that he did buy the soccer ball, and that he didn't. Quite plausibly, it's more probable or expected that he would claim he bought a soccer ball under the hypothesis that he did buy a soccer ball, than it is under the hypothesis that he didn't. When this sort of condition is met, someone claiming that P is indeed evidence that P is true. So claims certainly can be evidence, contrary to the slogan. Mistake number 18, testimony isn't evidence. And here we're going to be getting some help from Emerson Green from his video, Five Mistakes Atheists Make About Epistemology. Can testimony provide adequate justification for any of our beliefs? Or is testimonial evidence basically worthless? A lot of skeptics and atheists seem to think it's either worthless or very close to it. So first, what is testimony? It's very complicated. Testimony is when other people tell you things. That's it. So why are skeptics so down on other people telling you things? Well, testimony can be unreliable. People make honest mistakes, they're subject to biases, their faculties can mislead them, not to mention people sometimes lie. Even setting that possibility aside, we have hard evidence that eyewitness testimony, for example, is unreliable. Of course, none of these people actually conducted those experiments themselves. They hear about that hard evidence on podcasts, YouTube channels, articles, and so on. Then they believe that you can't trust testimony on the basis of the testimony they received about its untrustworthiness. No one thinks testimonial evidence is the top-shelf gold standard of evidence, that it's irrefutable proof or couldn't possibly be misleading. So why do skeptics think it's so damning to point out that testimony is not an infallible guide to truth? There's a bit of a gap between X is fallible and X provides no justification for anything. Testimony does provide some justification, and it's fallible. It's not really unique in that way. Our senses are fallible. Does that mean that our senses can't provide evidential support for anything? Of course not. They're fallible, and they confer justification. Scientific instruments are also fallible. Does that mean we should toss out results produced by scientific instruments? 
the experts in a given field are also fallible, and so on. That it's fallible is not enough to justify the idea that testimony provides no justification for a given belief. Maybe the problem is supposed to be that testimony is so unreliable. Infallibility is too high of a standard, sure, but we still want things to be reliable more often than not. But does testimony really fail this test? Think about all the things you believe where testimony played a crucial role in forming the belief. To quote Michael Humer, Almost all my interesting knowledge about the world is based on testimony. I know, for example, that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, that Japan is a country, that the U.S. originated from British colonies, that tables are made of atoms, and that the stars in the night sky are distant suns. I didn't figure out any of that myself. I learned all of it from other people. Without testimony, practically none of my current beliefs would be justified. End quote. Without testimony, how would we learn about most history? How would we learn about scientific findings that we didn't discover personally? Really, how would we know about much of anything outside our immediate field of awareness? Some philosophers argue that you're justified in trusting testimonial evidence by default. That's our starting point. The default is to trust it, to assume that what people are saying is by and large true, or at least reasonable to think given the evidence that they have available to them. That's the beginning assumption, and we'd need specific grounds to doubt a piece of testimonial evidence, not to trust it. Just to reiterate the point that's going to preclude 90% of the skeptical objections to this, you're justified in trusting testimony by default, as long as you have no specific grounds for doubt about a given piece of testimony. But why would you think it's definitely true? Well, I didn't say that. I said you are justified in trusting testimony by default. Didn't say it was definitely true. But what if they have an extensive history of lying about the subject? That would be a good reason for doubt. Their testimonial claim to have built a perpetual motion machine contradicts the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good reason to doubt their testimony. Again, you're justified in trusting testimony by default as long as you have no specific grounds for doubt. All right, on to mistake number 19. There is no evidence for theism. Or... Alternatively, there's no evidence for atheism. Now, this one isn't plausible either way. To take just one pretty easy example, listen, there are intelligent, well-informed, honest, truth-seeking theists. If you disagree with that, please just get out of your echo chamber and get into the world a little bit. This alone is at least some mild evidence for theism. Now, to appreciate this, suppose that this data didn't obtain. Like, suppose literally every single intelligent, well-informed, honest truth-seeker was an atheist. Well, in my view, that would clearly be evidence that atheism is true. Um, but it just logically follows from the fact that D is evidence for atheism, that not D, the negation of D, is evidence for theism. And that just follows from Bayes' theorem, as I explained in my Bayes' theorem video, and as I explained earlier in this video, albeit very briefly. So the fact that not every single intelligent, well-informed, honest, truth-seeker is an atheist, that is, the fact that there are intelligent, well-informed, honest, truth-seeking theists, is at least some evidence for theism. And note that the same reasoning holds in the reverse direction. There are also intelligent, well-informed, honest, truth-seeking atheists. Again, if you disagree with that, just get out of your echo chamber. For the same reason as before, this is going to be at least some mild evidence for atheism. So, everyone should stop saying that there's literally no evidence against their own view. Everyone should recognize that there's at least some evidence for each of theism and atheism. It is maximally implausible on its face. There's literally no fact about reality that counts even slightly against your own view. And it really suggests that you're probably either just sheltered or confused about the nature of evidence. All right, mistake number 20, one that is rampant with some Thomists on Twitter. Your probabilistic arguments for atheism fail because I have metaphysical demonstrations that deductively show that God exists, so your Bayesian arguments are worthless. So, here are some cases where I've seen people say these sorts of things. Again, I want to keep this totally anonymized because I'm not here to cancel anyone or to get anyone to swarm on anyone. So I, I've seen someone say, evidential arguments from evil prove nothing in the face of demonstrative arguments for God's existence and his goodness. This is someone responding to this. Uh, someone said, actually, this is incorrect. What matters is the epistemic probability of the premises themselves. And in demonstrative arguments, the premises are quite implausible. 
Um, someone else said, uh, in, in reference to Alex O'Connor, someone said, I feel like Alex presented three strong contentions to theism that should be contended with, those being divine hiddenness, geography is a reliable statistical indicator of theism, and gratuitous evil. And then someone replied by saying, well, none of those arguments can, get, can even get off the ground if God's existence is metaphysically demonstrable. Given those proofs, you can't even use terms like being or change without presupposing God's existence, let alone concepts like evil or geographical distribution. So this is one big mistake. Um, keep in mind that any deductive argument, including the chest-thumping metaphysical demonstrations, is simply a pattern of reasoning of the following form. The conjunction of the premises, P1 and P2 and P3 and so on through Pn, implies the conclusion. Secondly, that conjunction of premises is true, and so the conclusion follows. Right? That's, that just is what a deductive argument is. You have a conjunction of premises, which implies the conclusion, you go on to affirm the conjunction of the premises from which you can derive the conclusion. Notice though, that we can also equally reason like this. The conjunction of the premises indeed implies the conclusion, right? If the argument is logically valid, which it's gonna have to be to be a successful deductive argument, but the conclusion is false. And so at least one of the premises is false. In other words, it's not the case that the whole conjunction of premises is true. At least one of those individual conjuncts is false. So we've got two different kind of patterns of reasoning. Whenever one is confronted with a deductive argument, one has at least these two different patterns of reasoning that one can go through. One can affirm all the premises and thereby infer the conclusion, or one could reject the conclusion and thereby infer that at least one of the premises is false. To arbitrate between these two patterns of reasoning, to arbitrate which one of them we should go with, we need to compare the relative evidential weight favoring the conjunction of P1, P2, P3, and so on, up to Pn on the one hand, we need to compare that evidential weight favoring the conjunction of the premises with the evidential weight favoring the negation of the conclusion. So these patterns of reasoning share a first step. So it really all comes down to which second step here is more plausible. And to do that, we have to compare the evidential weight bearing on the negation of the conclusion with the evidential weight bearing on the conjunction of all the premises. And it's a perfectly legitimate form of reasoning to find overwhelming support for the negation of the conclusion, and on that basis, conclude that at least one of the premises is mistaken. And notice what this translates to. Someone might think they have a quote-unquote metaphysical demonstration of a conclusion. What that amounts to is they have a certain conjunction of premises, the premises lead to the conclusion, they affirm all the premises, and they infer the conclusion. But notice that one can still offer various arguments against the conclusion, Maybe they're not deductive, maybe they're only probabilistic, but they still count against the conclusion. And that can actually weigh in favor of this second step over here. It can weigh in favor of the negation of the conclusion. And then we have to compare how much they weigh in favor of the negation of the conclusion with the relevant justifications that one has for thinking that all the premises of the initial argument are true. And the more reasons that you have, and the stronger the reasons that you have for thinking that the conclusion is false, the more reasons you're gonna have for rejecting at least one of the premises. And again, this is true even if the arguments are deductive because as the person up here said, what really matters is the epistemic probability of the premises. That is how likely are they to be true in light of the relevant evidence? How confident should one be in the relevant premises in light of the justification presented on their behalf. And again, we simply have to weigh up the justification for the conjunction of the premises against the justification for the negation of the conclusion. And in principle, even though the argument is deductive, you could find that the justification for the negation of the conclusion outweighs the justification for the conjunction of the premises. So to illustrate all this, consider it mathematically. Right? Suppose we have an alleged proof of metaphysical position X with five premises. Now, suppose that for each premise, you are 90% confident that the premise is true, right? It may be better to suppose that for each premise, the support that your evidence base lends to it, right? The, the, the confidence that you should have in the premise in light of your evidence base is 90%. And so again, we're supposing that for each premise, you're 90% certain that the premise is true. And again, keep in mind that this is a really high number, probably unjustifiably high, given the staggering number of experts who disagree and have studied the topic thousands of hours longer than you, and given that there are probably a number of problems with the premises of which you are unaware or haven't yet come across or haven't yet thought of, etc. cetera, or fallible human beings, etc. So suppose that for each premise of the alleged metaphysical demonstration, you're only 90% confident in it, or that your evidence only renders it 90% likely to be true. Even if this is true, you can only justifiably be 59% confident on the basis of those premises, which I'm assuming, again, are probabilistically independent. You can only then be 59% confident on the basis of those premises in the conjunction of the premises. This means that to be consistent, you can only assign at most a 41% confidence in the denial of the conclusion, right? Because if you're 59% confident in the conjunction of the premises, and the conjunction of the premises entails the conclusion, well, whenever A entails B, 
B must be at least as probable as A. So the conclusion must be at least 59% probable. And so you can only assign at most a 41% confidence in the denial of the conclusion. What this means is that if other evidence and reasoning boosts your confidence in the denial of the conclusion to more than 41%, which isn't very hard to do, by the way, then in order to be consistent, you'll have to become correspondingly less confident that all of the premises in the demonstration are true. So for instance, if you come to be 65% confident that the conclusion is false based on other evidence, like gratuitous evil, like divine hiddenness, etc., then you can only be 35% confident at best that all of the premises in the de demonstration are true. In other words, you'll have to be at least 65% confident that at least one of the premises is false. And all of this is true regardless of what kind of evidence leads to the 65% confidence in the denial of the conclusion. For example, regardless of whether it's delivered by non-deductive or probabilistic arguments. So, one's belief in the soundness of that demonstration can easily be defeated by sufficiently weighty countervailing considerations, even if they're merely probabilistic or Bayesian in nature. It is simply confused, then, to say that evidential or probabilistic or Bayesian arguments are worthless in the face of deductive demonstrations. Such evidential arguments can easily decrease your confidence in the conjunction of the premises of the metaphysical demonstration to the point that it's far more reasonable to reject at least one of the premises than to accept them all. Evidence bearing on the probability of the conclusion itself will have a bearing on the probability of the premises. And that's true even if the evidence for the conclusion is probabilistic in nature, it's Bayesian in nature, and so on. And so it's simply false to say that these arguments can, can prove nothing in the face of demonstrative arguments for God's existence and his goodness. Well, yes, what matters is the epistemic probability of the premises themselves, and the epistemic probability of the premises, that is how confident we are in them in light of the justifications presented on their behalf, that's affected by how confident we should be in the conclusion. And probabilistic arguments against the conclusion are therefore obviously relevant to the epistemic merits of the premises within these quote-unquote demonstrative arguments. So it is simply mistaken to write off probabilistic arguments or Bayesian arguments simply because you have what you take to be successful deductive arguments. All right, so those are 20 mistakes. Now we are on to mistake number 21, and we're getting into the portion of this video on arguments, dialectic, and methodology. So mistake number 21 is saying, which God, in response to an argument for the existence of God. Almost always, such a response is simply irrelevant to the argument in question, since the express intent behind almost all arguments for God's existence is simply to show that there is like a perfect, personal, necessarily existent being who created the universe, aka there's a God. Most arguments for God's existence aren't even trying to show the precise characteristics of this God, like whether it's the Muslim God or the Christian God, etc. And so it's no objection to those arguments, and it's no problem for them that they don't show these sorts of precise characteristics of God. They weren't meant to do that in the first place. So please don't say, which God, in response to arguments for the existence of God. Mistake number 22, people saying like the cosmological argument or the ontological argument or the etc. Now, okay, I'm not here to necessarily police language, right? It's totally fine in some contexts to say like the cosmological argument or the ontological argument. But that should always be done in a very careful way when you know that it won't confuse or mislead the audience, okay? And very often it will confuse or mislead your audience because these are families of arguments. They're not singular arguments as terms like the cosmological argument lets on. U ultimately, there is no such thing as the cosmological argument. There's no such thing as the ontological argument. There's no such thing as the teleological argument. There are various cosmological arguments. There are various ontological arguments. There are various teleological arguments. And there isn't some monolithic single argument form that they ha all have in common. No, it's just not the case. Of course, they have various family resemblances and so on, but they're clearly distinct arguments. They oftentimes take distinct facts needing explanation. They often sometimes they don't even focus on explanation. Sometimes they focus on causation. Other times they focus on grounding. Other times they focus on just broad explanation. Sometimes they're getting to an uncaused thing. Sometimes they're getting to a necessary thing. And again, this applies to non-theistic arguments as well. So there isn't the hiddenness argument. Actually, there are hiddenness arguments. There isn't the argument from evil. There are actually arguments from evil, etc. To hear more about all these sorts of different arguments, you can check out my playlists. But to just take two examples, think about cosmological arguments. Like, there, there is, like, there are families of these. Again, like there are Kalam-style cosmological arguments, which focus on the beginning of temporal reality or the beginning of the universe or finite causal chains. And it says you kind of trace back to an uncaused first cause. There are cosmological arguments from contingency or contingency arguments, which focus on the fact that there are some things that could have failed to exist and tries to find an explanation for those things in terms of something that could not have failed to exist. 
There are Thomistic cosmological arguments, which seek to find something in the natural world around us, which requires a kind of continuously sustaining cause. And it goes on to say that since you can't have infinitely descending chains of more and more fundamental sustaining causes or sustaining grounds, you have to get to an unsustained fundamental layer of reality. And there are various other sorts of cosmological arguments. And again, even within these sorts of categories, there are like, you can't say the Thomistic cosmological argument or the contingency argument, because there are actually different forms of contingency arguments and different kinds of Thomistic cosmological arguments. Similarly, with ontological arguments, there is no such thing as the ontological argument. There are Anselmian ontological arguments. There are Cartesian or definitional ontological arguments. There are modal ontological arguments. There are Monoignian ontological arguments, Gerdelian or higher order ontological arguments, etc. So just be very careful when you're talking about quote unquote, the cosmological argument or the ontological argument, and also be very wary when you hear someone else say the cosmological argument and things like that. All right, mistake number 23. Your explanatory arguments for atheism fail because you're trying to determine what God would do. How can you know God's ways? I think that's a mistake, a kind of mistaken sort of thought behind this. In short, we can examine the features of the theistic hypothesis itself, in particular the features of God, his being all loving, all good, all knowing, and so on, and tease out predictions about how we'd expect a, the world to be or not to be on the basis of that world's being the result of a being with that sort of character. Right? I mean, if we know anything about love and goodness, for instance, we can predict how a holy, loving, and holy good being would plausibly, or at least might plausibly, behave. And note that theistic arguments themselves typically require us to make plausible inferences about what God would or might very well do, right? It's how theism gets its predictive power. All right, on to mistake number 24, which says there are only a small number of arguments for or against God. So sometimes people think like there's only like the cosmological argument, the ontological argument, and the teleological argument, the moral argument, and that's about it. There are like four or five arguments for theism. And I've also heard people say like, hey, there are only like there's only the argument from evil and the hiddenness argument. There are only two arguments for atheism. These are just painfully wrong misconceptions. There are well over 100 arguments for God's existence. You can see Karen Bertuzzi's video on Caption Christianity and my 12 hour long video discussing each of them in, in quite some depth. And there are also well over 100, in, in fact, upwards of 200 at minimum arguments against God's existence. Felipe Leon has a really nice blog post called 200 or so arguments for atheism, where he basically just goes through and links to different either scholarly articles or books or what have you that defend various arguments for atheism. And he says here, a popular view in contemporary analytic philosophy of religion is that while there are many arguments for theism, like cosmological, ontological, and teleological arguments, moral arguments, arguments from consciousness, etc. There are only two arguments for atheism, namely the problem of evil and more recently the problem of divine hiddenness. This is a misconception. Here are over 200 arguments for atheism spanning 28 different categories. And he just goes through cosmological type arguments for atheism, ontological type arguments, arguments from order, diseleological arguments, arguments from religion or religious experience, from morality and moral psychology, etc. My point is just that please don't say that there are only a small number of arguments for or against God's existence. That only shows your personal ignorance. All right, on to mistake number 25, merely slapping the label grounded by God on some fact or entity or phenomenon without actually giving an illuminating account of the phenomenon. That is, without specifying how God plays this explanatory role and how God illuminates the phenomenon in question. Now, this one is pretty self-explanatory, but it's just so rampant within apologetics, especially the kind of like lower level apologetics where they're, they're just, they'll just say that something is grounded by God and think that that sort of explains it. But they don't give any kind of illuminating account of how, how it's grounded in God. Like, what is God's precise relationship to this? Is it somehow like built into God's nature? What does that mean? Uh, is, is it caused by God? Is it grounded by God? Is it functionally realized by God? Is it co the contents of God's mind? Is it, uh, how, how do these work? In order for them to actually have a nice account, they need to put some flesh on the bones and give an illuminating account of the phenomenon. They need to specify how God plays this explanatory role with respect to the explanandum, the thing being explained, instead of just slapping a label on it and saying grounded by God. All right, mistake number 26, misusing, overemphasizing, and otherwise abusing fallacies. I like to call this one fallacy mongering, and it's very annoying. So let's get to pages 71 through 76 of Michael Humer's Knowledge, Reality, and Value to see what is mistaken with this misuse, overemphasis, and otherwise abuse of fallacies. In other words, let's see what's wrong with fallacy mongering. So here's Michael Humer helping explain what's wrong with fallacy mongering. So, Humor writes, I've just produced a list of fallacies of the sort that you find in traditional critical thinking books and classes. So he gives a list of fallacies above. But I don't much like these lists, not even my own, and I have two reasons for disliking them. 
First, I think they misdirect attention. They direct attention to some problems that occur rarely while neglecting much more common errors. Not all traditional fallacies are rare, of course, but several of them are quite rare. I'm not even sure I've ever seen someone affirm the consequent or deny the antecedent. To the extent that the list identifies genuine errors, most of them are pretty dumb, so you probably don't need much discussion of them. For some more common and useful to discuss errors, see section 4.3 below. And by the way, we're going to be getting to that section in just a minute in our video here. Second, I think the fallacy lists lure people into thinking that some perfectly good inferences are wrong, because these perfectly good inferences sound like what the fallacy definitions are talking about. I refer to this as the fallacy fallacy, which is the fallacy of rejecting a good inference because it has been superficially labeled as a fallacy. Let me explain with some examples. Ad hominem. Students who learn about the ad hominem fallacy are liable to draw the lesson that one should never reject an idea or argument because of who says it. But, in fact, negative information about an individual is often very relevant to whether you should believe what they say. For example, say you see a television ad for quote-unquote clean coal. The ad contains some evidence and arguments for the claim that your country should rely on more clean coal for its energy needs. Now suppose you find out that this ad was produced by a coal company that would stand a profit if people accept the ad's message. The particular company in question is an especially immoral one that has been in trouble with the law on several occasions for safety and environmental violations. Now, how should you treat this information? Ignore it because the bad traits of the company are irrelevant to the truth of its message? That might be what you would think after reading about the ad hominem fallacy in your critical thinking book. But of course, that would be wrong. The bias and the immoral qualities of the company make it very likely that the ad is going to be misleading or outright wrong. If the ad makers are any good at their job, you, without extensive expertise in the area, probably wouldn't be able to identify exactly how it is misleading. Therefore, you should apply a heavy skepticism to the ad and all of its content. In this case, you would be rejecting ideas and arguments because of the immorality of the party putting them forward. This sounds like exactly what people are calling the ad hominem fallacy, but it's not fallacious, it's smart. What about ad populum? Well, this is the quote-unquote fallacy of believing something because most people believe it. But what exactly is supposed to be wrong with that? Well, here are three interpretations. First, maybe the idea is that in most people believing P is irrelevant to whether P is true. That is, if most people believe it, that doesn't mean it is more likely to be correct. The problem is that this is obviously wrong. If most people believe something, that obviously does make it more likely to be correct than if most people don't believe it. If most of our beliefs weren't true, the human species would die out pretty much immediately. Sometimes people elaborate on this quote-unquote fallacy by citing examples of beliefs that were once widely held but were false, for example, that the sun orbits the earth. So let me now just mention a few typical examples of beliefs that are widely held. Dogs exist. It is generally lighter in the daytime than at night. The sky is blue, not red, green, or yellow. There are more than three human beings in existence. Human beings commonly have beliefs and desires. Putting your hand in a fire hurts. Six is more than two. The earth has existed for more than five minutes. When you drop rocks near the surface of the earth, they generally fall. No objects are completely red and simultaneously completely green, etc. Once you get the hang of it, I'm sure you can extend that list for quite a long time. Now, which would you say there are more of? Widely held beliefs that are true or widely held beliefs that are false? If you don't think most of those items are true, there's something seriously wrong. Second, maybe the idea is that most people believing P does not conclusively prove that P is true. Well, that's true, of course, but it's also a frivolous point to make. Of course it isn't conclusive proof. So what? Who is expecting conclusive proof? You may as well complain that it hasn't been conclusively proved that the Earth orbits the Sun. And of course that's true, right? It's merely overwhelmingly likely that the Earth orbits the Sun in light of our evidence. And thence conclude that modern astronomy rests on a quote-unquote fallacy. Third, maybe the idea is simply that people often put too much weight on popular opinion. The fact that many people believe P is indeed evidence for P, but it is not as probative as people think. This is indeed very plausible in many cases. It's easy to overgeneralize this point, though, so bear in mind that people don't always overestimate the reliability of popular opinion. What about appeals to authority? Well, students who read about the appeal to authority fallacy may conclude that one should never believe something because of who says it, but often one should. Especially if the person who says P is very smart and reasonable, then P is likely to be true. This doesn't guarantee that P is true, of course, but it often makes it likely. Begging the question. The concept of begging the question is often misused by philosophers. The misuse comes about something like this. The philosopher starts with the idea that an argument begs the question, and therefore is fallacious, when someone who rejects the conclusion wouldn't, or shouldn't, or couldn't reasonably be expected to, accept all the premises. That italicized phrase is treated as something like a definition of the fallacy. 
the philosopher then looks at some particular deductive argument. He notices that if you start by assuming the conclusion of the argument is false, you can deduce that one of the premises is false. Usually the philosopher identifies a specific premise that is least obvious and says that if the argument's conclusion is false, then that specific premise is false. He concludes that someone who rejected the argument's conclusion would also reject that premise. Therefore, to assert that premise is to beg the question. People who fall for this mistake fail to notice that it represents a rejection of all valid deductive reasoning. In a valid deductive argument, by definition, if all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. That is logically equivalent to the following. If the conclusion is false, then one of the premises must be false. So if you start by assuming the conclusion is false, and the argument was valid, you can always deduce that at least one of the premises is false. For example, take the argument, Miley Cyrus is a person, all people are mortal, therefore, Miley Cyrus is mortal. This could be said to beg the question, because if you don't think Miley Cyrus is mortal, then you should not accept the premise that all people are mortal. Given the obvious fact that Miley is a person, to assert that all people are mortal just quote-unquote assumes that Miley is mortal. In other words, it just assumes the very conclusion that you're trying to demonstrate, or so one might claim. Now, presumably it's false that all valid arguments are fallacious, so something went wrong there. The problem is the definition of begging the question. Here's a bad definition. You beg the question when someone who rejected your conclusion would reject one of your premises. Here's a better definition. You beg the question when the justification of one of your premises depends upon the justification of the conclusion. In the Miley inference mentioned above, it's true that someone who insists that Miley is immortal would presumably also deny that all people are mortal, but it's false that the justification for the claim that all people are mortal must depend upon the justification for the claim that Miley is mortal. Rather, the justification for the claim that all people are mortal could be had by, say, an inductive inference. Like, so far, literally every single person who has ever lived has died within 125 years of their birth. So the justification for thinking that premise is true does not require antecedently assuming that the conclusion is true or antecedently assuming that the conclusion is justified, etc. Next up is post hoc. When A is followed by B, that is evidence that A causes B, provided that you don't know anything to the contrary. Of course, it's not conclusive evidence, and in most cases, you need more information to form a justified belief. But talk of the post hoc quote-unquote fallacy is facile and unhelpful. It tempts students to think either, one, that the fact that A is followed by B is evidentially irrelevant to the causal claim, which is just wrong, or two, that an inference is only good if the premise conclusively proves the conclusion, which is also wrong. A related slogan is correlation doesn't imply causation. The saying means that just because A and B go together regularly does not mean that one causes the other. Granted, if there is a reliable correlation between A and B, that does not guarantee that there is a causal connection. It could just be a coincidence. But if the correlation is well established, it becomes vanishingly improbable that it's just a coincidence. There will likely be some causal explanation. Maybe A causes B, or B causes A, or some third factor C causes both A and B. But there are some errors that humans are prone to that you really do need to be aware of, beginning on page 77. Anecdotal evidence. So often people try to support generalizations by citing a single case or a few cases that support the generalization. And scientists call this anecdotal evidence. For example, you try to show that immigrants are dangerous by citing a few examples of immigrants who committed crimes. Now, anecdotal evidence has two problems. First, usually when people do this, they don't pick a case randomly. They search for a case that supports their conclusion while ignoring cases that don't. Second, random variation. Even if you pick the cases randomly, it can easily happen just by chance that you picked a few atypical cases. In the immigration example, what you should actually do is look up the statistics on crime rates for immigrants compared with native-born citizens. And, and also you should control for other factors when you do that, because sometimes immigrants are going to be finding themselves in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods and so on, and those sorts of things can also affect crime. And so it may not be immigrants specifically that's responsible for it, but socioeconomic status, etc. So anyway, you need to be very careful with statistics. As is said, there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. Base rate neglect, shout out here to my Bayes theorem video. I talk about this in depth and why like probabilistically it's a mistake and I go through the underlying reasons for why it's a mistake and how to try to combat it. But in short, a base rate is the frequency with which some type of phenomenon happens in general. For example, the base rate of heart disease is the percentage of people in the general population who have heart disease. The base rate for war is the percentage of the time that a country is at war, etc. When you want to know whether some kind of event is going to happen or has happened, the best place to start is with the base rate. If you want to know whether you have a certain disease, first, find out how common the disease is in general. If 1% of the population has it, then a good initial estimate is that you have a 1% chance of having it. From there, you should adjust that estimate up or down according to any special risk factors or low risk factors that you have. Most people don't do this. People commonly ignore base rates. For example, suppose there's a rare disease that afflicts one in a million people. 
there's a test for the disease that's 90% accurate. Suppose you took the test and you tested positive. In other words, the test says you have the disease. Question, given all this information, what is the probability that you have the disease? Now, many people think it's 90%, and even doctors will sometimes get this wrong, which is, of course, disturbing. But the correct answer is about 0.0009%, which is less than one in 100,000. And here's the explanation. Say there are 300 million people in the country. Of these, 300, that is one millionth, have the disease, and 299,999,700 don't. The test is 90% accurate. So 270 of the 300 people who have the disease are going to be testing positive, right? That's 90% of the 300. But also, 29,999,970 of the 299,999,700 who don't have the disease would also test positive, right? That's the 10% of the false positive rate. If it's a 90% accurate test, well, then 10% of the test results are going to be inaccurate. So among the basically 300 million people who don't have the disease, about 10% of them are still going to test positive for having the disease. And that's going to be close to about 30 million. So out of all the people who test positive, right, out of the 30 million people who test positive who don't actually have it, and the 270 people who tested positive who do have it, right, the proportion who actually have the disease among those who tested positive is 270 divided by 270 plus basically 30 million. And that's only 0.000009, or about 0.0009%. So in short, do not neglect base rates. Ah, yes, the dreaded confirmation bias. When asked to evaluate a theory, people have a systematic tendency to look for evidence supporting the theory and not to look for evidence against it. And this, this happens especially for theories that we already believe, but it can also happen for theories we initially have no opinion about. For example, if asked whether liberal politicians are more corrupt than conservative politicians, a conservative would search through their memory for any cases of a liberal doing something corrupt, and they would not search through their memory for cases of conservatives being corrupt. A liberal, on the other hand, would do the reverse. Each just looks for cases that support their pre-existing belief and doesn't look for evidence against it, and that's called confirmation bias, selectively searching out evidence in favor of your beliefs while ignoring or downplaying evidence against them. To combat this, it's necessary to make a conscious effort to think of exceptions to the generalizations that you accept, and to look for evidence against your existing beliefs. Whenever you feel inclined to cite some examples supporting belief A, stop and ask yourself whether you can also think of similar examples supporting the negation of A or the falsity of A. Dogmatism and overconfidence. So people who study rationality have a notion called calibration. Your beliefs are said to be well calibrated when your level of confidence matches the probability of your being correct. For example, from all the beliefs that you hold with 90% confidence, about 90% of them should be true. When you're 100% confident of the things, they should be true 100% of the time, etc. Now, most people are quite badly calibrated. In fact, almost everyone errs in a particular direction. Almost everyone's beliefs are far too confident. People say they are 100% certain of a bunch of things, but then it turns out that only, say, 85% of those things are actually true, and there are psychological studies of this. This is the problem of overconfidence. Almost everyone has it, and almost no one has the opposite problem, underconfidence. So you should assume that you are probably overconfident in your beliefs. You should therefore try to reduce your confidence in your beliefs, particularly about controversial things, and particularly for speculative or subjective claims. For the vast majority of individuals who hold positions and opinions on philosophical topics, there are going to be many, many more people who have studied the subject longer than them, who know more of the literature than them, who know of objections to their positions that the people are unaware of, who perhaps are more intelligent than them, and so on, and yet who disagree with them. Quite plausibly, that should at least lower your confidence to some extent in your positions. <laughs> no one's saying here that you have to become a radical skeptic in light of all this, but it would seem kind of bizarre to recognize that there are people who have studied this subject far longer than you, many of whom are more intelligent than you, many of whom are aware of objections and arguments of which you aren't aware bearing on the question, and who disagree with you. To be utterly unmoved by that seems a bit dogmatic and overconfident. Another problem is oversimplification. People so often oversimplify philosophical issues. Say you're thinking about the morality of abortion. Attempting simplification would be to say that there are just two positions, pro-choice and pro-life, or pro and anti-abortion. Either fetuses are people and killing them is murder, or fetuses aren't people and killing them is perfectly fine. But this overlooks the possibility that late-term fetuses are people, but early-term fetuses are not. Or maybe personhood comes in degrees, and fetuses become progressively more person-like as they develop. Or maybe fetuses are persons in some senses, but non-persons in other senses. And maybe some of those senses may be morally relevant, maybe some are more morally relevant than others. Or maybe they are persons and have a right to life, but perhaps right to life does not imply right to use of another person's body, etc. 
there are a range of possible positions on this topic, not just two, and people tend to way oversimplify these topics. I'm not saying that any of these positions here is correct. My sole point is just that there are a number of conceptual possibilities within the conceptual landscape with respect to abortion, as well as lots of other philosophical topics. And people far too often oversimplify them. They get in a kind of dichotomous mindset where there's either position A or B, neglecting that there are countless other positions. Oh yes, treatment effects versus selection effects. This one's big that I'd like to go through. Let's say that you've created a new educational program for preschool children. You want to know whether it improves learning. What you would do is look at kids after they've had your program and compare them to the kids of the same age who didn't have your program and see if the first group performed better on tests. Let's say the kids who had your special program performed 10% better on later tests on average. Then you'd probably conclude that your program works. But wait, here's another possibility. Suppose, as would usually be the case, that the kids who entered your special education program were the kids whose parents chose to enroll them in that program. The rest were kids whose parents did not decide to enroll them. Furthermore, maybe the parents who enroll their kids in special programs are on average smarter and value education more, and perhaps have a higher socioeconomic status, etc., than the parents who don't do that. Furthermore, maybe intelligence and value placed on learning are partly genetic, and moreover, maybe these parents' socioeconomic status and various other environmental factors are influencing it, and so these parents pass those traits on to their kids, and the environment that these kids are growing up in affects them as well. So the children who went into your program were already on average smarter and more interested in learning than the children who didn't go into the program. And maybe that explains why they did 10% better on the tests after the program. Maybe your program has no effect at all. It's just that you got the smart kids in it and that made the program look good. That is an example of a selection effect, a case where it looks like A causes B, but it's actually just that the instances of A that you tested were already more likely to be Bs for other reasons. Selection effects are contrasted with treatment effects, cases where the thing you're testing really does cause the effect that it's thought to cause. In the education example, academic success is correlated with taking the special program. This could be due to a treatment effect, right, meaning that the program causes kids to learn more, or it could be due to a selection effect, right, meaning the program selects students who are already good at learning. Selection effects are very often mistaken for treatment effects. I'm going to give my own example of this in a second, but let's go through humors. You Say you want to know if some vitamin improves people's health. So you look at people who take supplements of that vitamin regularly, and you find that they are healthier than the people who don't take it. You think this shows that the vitamin supplements are good for people. But actually, it's more likely a selection effect. People who take vitamins are more likely to also be exercising, eating healthy foods, paying attention to their diet, and so on, which is why they would be healthier on average even if the vitamins did absolutely nothing for them. But here's another example that comes up sometimes on Twitter and just internet spheres more generally. Quite often I've seen apologists appeal to the preponderance of theists within the field of philosophy of religion as somehow indicative of the epistemic merits of theism vis-a-vis -vis atheism. Right, so if you go to the 2020 Phil Papers survey, the vast majority of philosophers are atheists. But when you look at specifically philosophers specializing in philosophy of religion, the numbers flip. The vast majority of philosophers of religion are theists. Some apologists are wanting to say, oh, hey, look, the people who are best situated on the topic, the philosophers of religion, are theists. So that's indicative of the epistemic merits of theism, or maybe this is powerful evidence for theism and so on. But very plausibly, this is best explained by a selection effect. Those who are theists are more likely to go into philosophy of religion and study religion and their theistic beliefs in the first place. They're just going to be far more interested in it. It's going to be something that's part of their daily life, etc. And there's also some empirical reasons to think that selection effects are responsible for this. And in general, I mean, to those apologists who are appealing to theists dominating philosophy of religion as strongly indicative of the epistemic merits of theism, I mean, to me, that's about as silly as saying that, well, hey, uh, Islam must be true. And the epistemic merits of Islam are very strongly indicated by the fact that those who actually specialize in Islamic philosophy, you know, those best positioned to evaluate the merits of, of Islam and the, and the reasons for Islam, almost all of them are Muslims, which is true, by the way. I mean, let's just take a step back. And I'm ho I, I use this example because it's going to be helping the Christian apologists who make use of this point about theists dominating philosophy of religion. Hmm. I wonder why those who specialize in Islamic philosophy are almost all Muslims. Hmm. Let's think for just a second. Maybe it's because among those philosophically inclined, Muslims are far more likely to go in and actually specialize in Islamic philosophy than non-Muslims. The best explanation for the preponderance of Muslims within, the, within those who specialize on Islamic philosophy is this selection effect.
they're just far more likely to do that in the first place. And quite plausibly, the same thing is going to be happening with the Phil Paper survey. Very plausibly, the dominance of theists within philosophy of religion is explained by a selection effect. Theists are just far more likely to be specializing in philosophy of religion. Anyway, for all this fallacy-mongering stuff, I highly recommend Emerson Green's video, Why I Don't Care About Logical Fallacies, as well as the full podcast episode from which this little extract was taken. So in short, whenever you see someone say, that's a fallacy, that's a fallacy, that's a fallacy, have them spell out what exactly is fallacious about it, and whether the point can be put in another way which doesn't succumb to the relevant fallacy. And just beware of all these fallacy websites. They usually far oversimplify fallacies, like they'll far oversimplify begging the question. Begging the question is actually a very difficult and vexed philosophical topic in itself. There's lots of philosophical work on it. So just be very careful and recognize nuance. This all goes to the oversimplification point. All right, on to mistake number 27, thinking that saying you're a moron and the like is an ad hominem fallacy. No, no, it's not. An insult is not a fallacy. I mean, I'm not recommending that you insult people, but an insult is not a fallacy, right? In a fallacy, you commit a mistake in reasoning. But merely insulting someone isn't a mistake in reasoning, okay? Mistake number 28, demanding clean, necessary, and sufficient conditions for the application of terms and concepts. Again, humor notes, after the most strenuous efforts over a period of decades, if not centuries, we've managed to produce approximately zero correct definitions or analyses of philosophically significant terms. A definition or analysis in this context is just providing clean, necessary, and sufficient conditions that accurately categorize a concept or term in all possible circumstances. So yeah, after decades, if not centuries, we've managed to produce approximately zero correct definitions or analyses of philosophically significant terms like knowledge, justice, beauty, goodness, truth, etc. We shouldn't expect, then, that someone give a clean set of necessary and sufficient conditions specifying the meaning or application conditions of the terms and concepts that they use. Our concepts more generally aren't like Legos. Concepts very rarely cleanly decompose into a small number of more basic concepts, and there are several reasons for this. So here are several reasons that humor adduces. First, understanding a word, except in rare cases, is not a matter of knowing a definition. Instead, understanding a word is a matter of having the appropriate dispositions to use the word being disposed to apply the word to the things that it applies to, and not apply it to the things that it doesn't apply to. Accordingly, the way that we learn words is hardly ever by being given a verbal description of the word's meaning. We learn almost all of our words by observing others use the words in context and then attempting to imitate their usage. Second, because concepts are dispositional mental states, most features of a given concept are not directly introspectively observable. Our main access to the implications of a concept comes not through directly reflecting on the concept, but through activating the dispositions that constitute our understanding. When we confront a particular situation, whether in reality or in our imagination, we find ourselves inclined to describe the situation in a particular way, using particular words like, oh yeah, that subject definitely doesn't know that, that proposition in that sort of case. And that reveals the contours of the concepts expressed by those words. But notice then that like the features of the concept are very difficult to directly introspectively observe. Like we know how to use a term, but one of the reasons that we're not able to provide clean, necessary, and sufficient conditions and give an account of its meaning right off the bat is because those concepts are dispositional mental states. They're dispositions to apply the term in certain contexts. And as such, they're not like, for instance, states of pain, which are like occurrent, non-dispositional features that like you can directly observe within your own mind occurring right now. And humor notes that this is, this is no counsel of despair, right? The same theory that explains why we haven't produced any good definitions also explains why it was a mistake to even want them in the first place. We learn a concept through exposure to its usage in our speech community, and we apply it by imitating that usage. To be clear, all of this concerns like the ordinary senses of words that appear in ordinary language. Technical terms, though, are another matter, right? Naturally, if someone introduces a new term or proposes to use a term in a new sense, they still need to explain what it means, right? So this is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, but it is a plea to make people aware that it's not always legitimate and very often illegitimate to demand that your dialectical partner provide clean, necessary, and sufficient conditions that specify the meaning or definition of a term. All right, mistake number 29, thinking that simplicity is a tiebreaker. The problem with this is that simplicity is not best understood as a tiebreaker, which is operative only when all else is equal between theories. Right, so here we are talking about comparing different theories or hypotheses and their theoretical virtues or their merits, qua theories or qua hypotheses, croissant, croissant, and simplicity is one of those theoretical virtues. 
But some people try to construe simplicity as it's a mere tiebreaker. You know, it only comes into play when theory, when all else is equal between theories. So they're equally explanatory. They have equal unificatory power. They're equal in their fit with background knowledge and background data and so on. Only then does simplicity matter and come in to kind of break the tie between the hypotheses. But that is a mistaken view, as Alexander Proust argues quite convincingly, and I'm going to take you through his blog post here because it's a short blog post and it's quite good and it explains why simplicity is not a tiebreaker. I, says Proust, I like to illustrate the evidential force of simplicity by noting that for about 200 years, people justifiably believed that the force of gravity was g, the gravitational constant, times m1 times m2, so that's the masses of the two relevant bodies, divided by r squared, which is the square of the distance between them, right? People just I believe that the force of gravity was equal to that, even though g times m1 times m2 divided by r to the power of 2 plus epsilon fit the observational data better for some small enough but non-zero valued epsilon. A minor point about this struck me yesterday. There is doubtless some p which is distinct from 2, such that g times m1 times m2 divided by r to the power of p would have fit the observational data better. For in general, when you make sufficiently high precision measurements, you never find exactly the correct value. There's always noise going on, etc. So if someone bothered to collate all the observational data and figure out exactly which p is the best fit, for example, which one is exactly in the middle of the normal distribution that best fits all the observations, the chance that that number would be 2 up to the requisite number of significant figures would be vanishingly small, even if in fact the true value is p equals 2. So simplicity is not merely a tiebreaker. And note that our preference for simplicity here is actually infinite. For if we were to collate the data, there would not just be one real number that fits the data better than 2 does, but a range, j, of real numbers that fits the data better than 2. And j, of course, contains uncountably many real numbers. Yet we rightly think that 2 is more likely than the claim that the true exponent is in j. So 2 must be infinitely more likely than most of the numbers in j. Right, 2 is far simpler, far more elegant, far less arbitrary, etc. So to briefly recap Proust's argument, consider hypotheses about the mathematical law governing the gravitational behavior of physical things. One hypothesis that predicts the observational data quite well is that the law is an inverse square law. That is, you know, that's what you saw, the inverse square. It's r is in the denominator, it's the inverse of the distance between the bodies, and you square that, right? But for some incredibly small number n, the hypothesis that the law is an inverse 2 plus n law will actually predict our observational data better than the inverse square law hypothesis. But still, it seems obvious that we should settle on the inverse square law hypothesis. And indeed, this is precisely what scientists in fact settle on, because it is far simpler than the inverse 2 plus n law hypothesis. However, notice that not everything else is equal between these hypotheses, right? Since the inverse 2 plus n law hypothesis actually predicts the observational data slightly better than the inverse square law hypothesis. And what this shows is that simplicity is not merely a tiebreaker operative only when all else is equal. Simplicity carries intrinsic epistemic weight as a theoretical virtue. All right, mistake number 30, only fundamental things count towards simplicity. So fundamental things are things that aren't like grounded in or that don't obtain in virtue of things that are deeper in reality than them, things that are more basic, lower down in the explanatory chain than them. So it's fundamental, then it's not explained by any more basic features of reality. It doesn't obtain in virtue of any more basic features of reality. It's not grounded in anything else, etc. So some people have thought that only fundamental things count towards simplicity when we're evaluating certain hypotheses. When we're trying to assess the simplicity of the respective hypotheses and how they compare with one another on that front, some people think that you really should only be taking into account what each theory says is fundamental. You shouldn't be taking into account non-fundamental things as well. But in my view, that is deeply implausible and overlooks very serious objections. For, I mean, for starters, like scientists working in biology, for instance, like they appeal to simplicity very often to arbitrate between hypotheses. But I mean, like biologists aren't working with the fundamental nature of reality, right? I mean, if the fundamental nature of reality is gonna be probably just going to be something like, if you're a physicalist, it's probably going to be something like quarks or like quantum fields or something like that. If you're a theist, it's going to be something like God. But very few people think that like, you know, the macroscopic level of biological organisms is going to be like the fundamental layer of reality. Instead, lots of people think that biological facts and biological systems obtain in virtue of more fundamental chemical facts and chemical systems, which themselves obtain in virtue of more fundamental physical facts and physical systems and so on. So notice then that biologists are basically exclusively working with non-fundamental things. But clearly, simplicity still plays and ought to play a regulative role 
in comparing bio hypotheses about the biological world. So it's just false to say that only fundamental things count towards simplicity, because you know, biologists rightly use simplicity as a guide in theory choice, and yet their domain exclusively concerns non-fundamental things. But also, like, I mean, even within metaphysics, like, appeals to simplicity with respect to non-fundamental things seem perfectly appropriate. Consider, for instance, the solution to the problem of the many, which posits that for each seemingly single object around us, there are actually trillions upon trillions of co-located, qualitatively similar, non-fundamental objects differing by only one or a few atoms near their peripheries. For example, instead of one bird on the branch outside my window, there are literally trillions upon trillions of co-located birds, or bird-like objects there. This monstrous metaphysical profligacy seems clearly to count against any theory which posits as much. Alternatively, simply consider a different view which posits infinitely many co-located, indiscernible, non-fundamental objects present exactly where any single non-fundamental object is located, without the multiplication of their fundamental bases. Such a view predicts all of our data, just as well as the hypothesis that there aren't untold numbers of such co-located, indiscernible, non-fundamental objects. Still, though, it seems obvious that this view's grotesque violation of simplicity counts strongly against it. Or consider Trenton Merrick's causal redundancy argument, which employs the plausible Occam's razor type principle that we should deny the existence of those alleged physical objects that would be, of necessity, wholly causally redundant, especially if we have no good ordinary reasons to believe in such objects. And so on, down the line of seemingly legitimate appeals to simplicity concerning non-fundamental things within a non-scientific metaphysical context. Second, there are good Bayesian grounds for rejecting the restriction of simplicity considerations to fundamental things only. Unless the epistemic probability of the non-fundamental things, properties, and phenomena conditional on the fundamental things, properties, and phenomena is one, then we decidedly do not get non-fundamental things for free. They are going to count. In other words, they're going to reduce the probability of our overall hypothesis. And so our theory is incurring a probabilistic disadvantage by being less simple. This just follows from the fact that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B. Right? If B is fundamental and grounds the non-fundamental A, the probability of A and B is guaranteed to be less than the probability of B when the probability of A given B is less than 1, assuming, of course, that the probability of B isn't 0. And that will very often be true, in which case the postulation of A in addition to B does reduce the probability of one's theory. Right, so the postulation of the non-fundamental thing, in addition to the fundamental thing, does reduce the probability of your theory. It's a cost, and it doesn't come for free when the probability that A obtains, given that B obtains, is less than 1. But anyway, that's the second point. And then a third point is that the view that only fundamental things count towards simplicity considerations fails to take account of the theoretical content characterizing non-fundamental things that's underivable from one's theoretical content characterizing fundamental things. Like, suppose that we're comparing two versions of grounding physicalism. The version one says that all facts about one's mental life are grounded in one's neurophysiological facts. Version two says all facts about one's mental life are grounded in one's neurophysiological facts, and there are also 17 purely epiphenomenal mental lives running in parallel, each unaware of the rest, such that all the facts about those mental lives are likewise grounded in one's neurophysiological facts. The first of these seven mental lives has a favorite food, pickles dipped in Grater's double chocolate ice cream. The second of these 17 mental lives experiences a phenomenology consisting solely of the felt aspects of tepid bathwater and the scent of molding cranberries. The third of these mental lives, <laughs> you see where I'm going. Notice that V2 is absurdly less simple than V1, and this obviously counts against V2 in relation to V1, despite the fact that they only disagree over non-fundamental matters. The proposal that only fundamental things count toward simplicity is unable to account for this. And notice that V2 isn't worse than V1 solely on account of ontological simplicity, that is, in the number of entities it posits. After all, V2 is obviously more complex than V3, which I'm about to specify, and it's worse than V3 by dint of this complexity, despite agreeing on ontology, that is, despite agreeing about what entities there are. So here's V3. All the facts about one's mental life are grounded in one's neurophysiological facts, and there are also 17 purely epiphenomenal mental lives running in parallel, each unaware of the rest, such that all the facts about those mental lives are likewise grounded in one's neurophysiological facts. What all this shows is that when comparing theories, we need to take account of their theoretical characterizations of, that is, their commitments concerning or their postulations about non-fundamental things. If those theoretical commitments or characterizations or postulations are not derivable from the existence of the fundamental things, or are theoretical characterizations of those fundamental things, then our theory incurs a complexity cost by making such postulations. The methodological approach in question, which says that only fundamental things count toward simplicity, completely overlooks this crucial fact about theory comparison. One might ask, why is all this relevant? 
Well, it shows that it's just flatly mistaken to count only fundamental things when assessing the simplicity of theories. And it's also relevant to the God debate, right? Even if everything about the non-God realm is non-fundamental, we are hopelessly unable to derive facts about the non-God realm from theoretical postulations about God. But then our theory's commitments to these facts about non-God reality contributes to our theory's theoretical complexity, even though they're non-fundamental facts, right? Because they're grounded in God, we're supposing. Grounding is a metaphysical notion, and it doesn't automatically translate into economy of theory or ideology, right? Since we may still need primitive, that is not further defined vocabulary, to accurately characterize the non-fundamental things. According to one's theory, X, and perhaps everything about X, may be grounded in Y, but we may not be able to derive X or anything about X from Y. And in that case, our specification of X's existence and properties within our theory contributes to our theory's complexity, even though X is non-fundamental. Now, you might object that, well, the probability of non-fundamental things conditional on the fundamental things has to be one, right? Because the fundamental things ground the non-fundamental things, and so they sort of metaphysically necessitate them. But notice that A metaphysically necessitating B is different from the epistemic probability of B conditional on A being one. The latter holds only if you're able to, like, logically or else conceptually derive B from A. But very often, in claims of grounding, you're not able to do that. Anyway, I talk about this more on the screen here, but we are going to move on to mistake number 31, which is only comparing a portion of your worldview with another fully fleshed out worldview. Now, it's no good to compare only a portion of your worldview with another fully fleshed out worldview, right? I mean, it's a hollow victory if you show that a portion of your worldview, say, bare, philosophically abstract, non-religious theism is superior to naturalism. Okay, cool, but you don't believe Phil of bare, philosophically abstract, non-religious theism. Instead, the people who are very often making these comparisons have a different view than that. Their worldview is, say, Christianity, replete with all its wide-ranging commitments to demon possession, incarnations, miracles, heaven, purgatory, hell, magisterial authority, biblical inspiration, sacraments, etc. And when you compare your worldview as such to naturalism, it becomes extremely implausible that naturalism is going to be less simple than your, than your alternative worldview. So in short, I've seen lots of apologists try to argue that theism is simpler than naturalism and so on, and they're just using this bare, abstract, philosophical, non-religious theism. I wouldn't grant that that's simpler than naturalism, but even if it were, it's a hollow victory if your worldview isn't actually this bare, non-religious theism. If instead your commitments are to Christianity specifically, with all the wide-ranging commitments to demon possession, incarnations, miracles, heaven, hell, Jesus having two natures, being fully human, fully divine at the same time, three divine persons all being one God and the and the internal relations between them, the, the relations of procession and generation and whatnot, that is definitely not simpler than naturalism. And so when you actually take these people's real beliefs and compare them with the relevant alternative worldview, their appeals to simplicity with respect to a different worldview seem quite hollow indeed. All right, on to mistake number 32, latching onto irrelevant features of an analogy. I have seen people say that belief in God meshes well with contemporary metaphysical theorizing under a certain view of God, because under this view of God, God is a trope, and tropes are a category of thing, belief in which is widespread in contemporary metaphysics. As I pointed out in response, this is not good reasoning. That does not show that your theory of God, specifically, meshes well with contemporary metaphysical theorizing. I mean, that's like saying that, well, hey, you know, I've got this belief in fairies, but under my view, fairies are just substances, right? They're, they're a specific kind of substances. And, you know, substances are already, you know, belief in which is widespread in contemporary metaphysics. You know, metaphysicians are already theorizing quite a lot about substances and so on. So belief in fairies must therefore mesh well with contemporary metaphysical theorizing. That's exactly like what these people are arguing with respect to God. God is a category of thing, namely a trope, belief in which is widespread in metaphysics. Therefore, this sort of theism meshes well with contemporary metaphysical theorizing. And that's a reductio of that kind of reasoning. Because no, belief in fairies decidedly does not mesh well with contemporary metaphysical theorizing, even though fairies under this sort of view fall under a category of thing, belief in which is widespread in contemporary metaphysics. Now, this is just an example, right? This is just an example of an analogy that I gave to help kind of show the mistaken nature of their reasoning, of their argument. And like people will re literally respond to you when you say that, that, oh, so you think like belief in theism is as rational as belief in fairies? No, that's not what I was saying. Like, just no, you are latching onto an irrelevant feature of the analogy. I was not equating the epistemic credentials of theism with the epistemic credentials of belief in fairies, right? My analogy was meant solely to illustrate that one is mistaken in inferring that something meshes well with contemporary metaphysics merely from the fact that X falls under a category of thing, belief in which is widespread in contemporary metaphysics. That was the sole point of the analogy, and the analogy holds with respect to that point. 
And so many times when people come across an analogy, which is meant to make a particular point, they latch onto irrelevant features of the analogy and they think that you're comparing the things along a separate dimension. No, please stop doing that. So please, please, please do not latch on to irrelevant features of an analogy. Always be careful when you're objecting to an analogy that if you're going to pinpoint a difference between the analogy and the thing that the analogy is meant to draw an analogy to, make sure that it's a relevant difference between the cases, not an irrelevant difference, or not some feature which is unrelated to the point that the analogy was meant to make. All right, mistake number 33, God of the Gaps galore. So some atheists, especially new atheists, totally overuse the God of the Gaps accusation. It's as if they think that like every argument for theism says we don't know why something exists or happens, therefore God did it. But that's not how 99% of serious theistic arguments work. Now, don't get me wrong, many ordinary folk without philosophical training have argued in precisely this way. I've actually personally come across people in my life who say things like, we can't scientifically explain life's origin, God must have done it things like that. So in some contexts, it will be appropriate to charge someone's argument with God of the gaps. But please just know that when it comes to any argument for God's existence worth taking seriously, such as the fine-tuning argument, the psychophysical harmony argument, contingency arguments, etc., they decidedly do not commit the God of the gaps reasoning. The contingency argument, and of course I'm violating one of my own mistakes from earlier, right? Contingency arguments, is that's actually a family of arguments. But actually for present purposes, I'm not misleading anyone by saying the contingency argument. But anyway, Contingency arguments in general don't reason that because we don't know why the universe exists, God must explain it. They don't go from our ignorance of something to therefore God did it. That's just not how they work. If you want to know how they do work, check out my playlist on contingency arguments. Mistake number 34, blaming arguments for not proving what they weren't trying to prove. So often people will just simply be trying to give an argument for God's existence, and people will respond by saying, like, that doesn't prove Christianity, or like, you still got all the work ahead of you to show that Christianity is true. It's like, okay, but they're not trying to show that Christianity is true. They're just trying to justify God's existence or things like that. So don't blame arguments for not proving what they weren't trying to prove. Mistake number 35, you can't prove a negative. This claim is self-defeating. If you could prove or show that this is the case, well, then you would have thereby shown that you cannot prove a negative. In other words, you would have thereby proven a negative, right? You would have proven that it's not the case that a negative can be proven. And so if you could show that this very statement is true, you would have demonstrated its own falsity. And so it's self-defeating. I mean, listen, either you can't show it's true, in which case, why are you saying it? It's not going to be justified. Or you can show that it's true, in which case you can prove a negative, and, and in which case it's going to have to be false. It entails that it's either unjustified or that it's false. It, it either undermines itself or rebuts itself. Now, you might think, well, what I'm saying is that you can't like decisively, conclusively prove a negative, but you can still justify various negative claims. One problem for that is that you actually can prove a negative for independent reasons. I mean, there's an entire law of logic dedicated to proving negatives, namely the law of non-contradiction, which, which says that there can be no true contradictions, which has as a consequence that it's not the case that anything can be both A and not A in the same respect and at the same time. And so if you can show that something implies that something would have to be both A and not A in the same respect and at the same time, as many people have shown with lots of different things, well, then we can prove that it's not the case that those things exist. For instance, we could prove that it's not the case that there exists a square circle. That would amount to something being both square and not a square, which is impossible. So it's also false to say that you cannot prove a negative. But also, like, once you go that weak route and say you like, well, what I'm just saying is that you can't conclusively demonstrate a negative. You can justify various negative claims. Once you say that, well, then you're kind of zapping this motto of its force. Like, usually this comes up when people are asking for justification for thinking God doesn't exist. And when people respond to that by saying you can't prove a negative, you know, you know what they're trying to say. They're trying to say, well, you know, you can't justify those sorts of negative claims. If, they, if what they're really saying was, well, you can't decisively demonstrate that they're the case, well, then that response would just be irrelevant to someone requesting for at least some reason to think that God doesn't exist or some justification. And in any case, literally any universal generalization is equivalent to a negative claim. Right? If you say all Fs are G, you're saying that no Fs are non-G. If all cats are white, then no cats fail to be white. That is, no cats are non-white. And, of course, we can definitely know various universal generalizations and show them to be true. For example, that all electrons are negatively charged, that all humans are animals, and so on. And notice that these are all equivalent to negative claims, right? To show that all electrons are negatively charged, you will thereby show that there are no non-negatively charged electrons. That's a negative claim. And since we can come to know that all electrons are negatively charged, or come to know that all squares have four sides, and so on, we can thereby come to know various negative claims. You can, in short, prove a negative. So please stop saying otherwise. All right, mistake number 36. Just taking some seemingly random philosophical problem and saying God is needed to solve it. Now, I've seen presuppositionalists do this a ton, and it comes up surprisingly often with others, too. 
Take, for instance, the problem of induction, which is basically the difficulty of justifying why unobserved cases will probably resemble observed cases. For instance, why observed regularities in the past will continue into the future. Now, some people on the internet will just rush in to say that God has needed to solve the problem, and so they give something like an argument for theism from the problem of induction. Usually these internet people don't actually give an argument, but merely assert that God has needed to solve the problem, but set that aside. And this relates to an earlier problem where, you know, someone just like slaps a label grounded by God on something without actually giving an illuminating account of how God really does provide a satisfactory explanation of the relevant phenomenon. But anyway, again, set that aside. In general, there are two problems facing these sorts of arguments. First, it's very often entirely unclear whether adding God to the picture actually helps anything. So for instance, in the case of induction, just as we can wonder how we are justified in taking the future or unobserved cases to be relevantly similar to the past or observed cases, we can equally wonder how we're justified in believing that God ensures that the future or unobserved cases will be relevantly similar to the past or observed cases. It seems like adding God only relocates rather than resolves the problem. Second, it's very often the case that a non-theistic solution to the relevant problem is not only available, but quite defensible. So, for instance, to take the example of induction, Michael Humer, among many others, has defended solutions to the problem of induction which make no reference to God. You can see, for instance, his recent book, Understanding Knowledge. All right, mistake number 37, thinking that you have to specify which premise is false in order to respond to an argument. No, no. No, <laughs> you don't have to specify which premise is false in order to successfully respond to an argument. Here are lots of different ways that you can successfully respond to an argument without specifying which premise is false. First, you can show that the argument is invalid in the case of a deductive argument. That is, that its conclusion does not logically follow from its premises. Or alternatively, you can show that the argument is weak in the case of a non-deductive argument. That is, that the premises, even if true, do not actually probabilistically support the conclusion, or perhaps would only offer negligible probabilistic support for it. For more on this point, you can see my video, How to Analyze Arguments Like a Philosopher. Next, you can point out ambiguities or unclarities in the argument, which prevent proper assessment thereof, and which also prevent the argument from going through successfully. You can point out that some premise is unjustified, or that it begs the question, and that one could only be in a position to justifiably accept the premise if one already believes in or if one is already justified in believing in the conclusion. You can point out that if the argument is successful, then an absurd parody argument is also successful. But since that parody argument isn't successful, the argument must go wrong somewhere, even if you can't pinpoint precisely where. You can also point out that the motivations for one of the premises in the argument would equally motivate a different claim incompatible with that premise, or incompatible with another premise in the argument, or incompatible with the conclusion. You can also point out that the conclusion, if true, defeats one or more of the premises. Right? This doesn't require specifying which premise must be false, right? You can simply rest content by showing that the argument is self-defeating without pinpointing which premise is false. Similarly, you can give a dilemma, either P or not P. But under P, premise 1 is false, whereas under not P, premise 2 is false. Once again, here you don't have to take a stance on which precise premise is false. You can also argue that the negation of the conclusion is more plausible than the conjunction of the premises, and hence justifiably conclude that at least one of the premises is false, even though you may not be able to pinpoint exactly which premise is mistaken. And on and on and on and on. There are so many different ways that you can respond to an argument without specifying which premise is false. So if you're in a conversation with someone and you're responding to their argument and they're demanding that you specify which exact premise that you reject or which exact premise you think is false, that may be an illegitimate demand. Of course, sometimes it may not be an illegitimate demand, right? Sometimes someone will offer justification for their premises, they won't beg the question, the argument will be entirely valid, there won't be ambiguities or unclarities, there won't be parody arguments at play, and so on. And in that case, it can be fine to press your opponent and say, which premise do you reject? My overall point, though, is that don't let someone back you into a corner and utterly demand that you show which exact premise is false, even though you have other ways of responding to the argument which don't involve pinpointing which precise premise is false. You can successfully respond to an argument without showing which premise is false. Shout it from the rooftops, scream it from the pulpit. Okay, mistake number 38, thinking that a sound argument is automatically a good argument. A professional philosopher once tweeted this. I don't think it's a good idea to frame su the success of an argument in psychological terms. If an argument is sound and has true premises, of course, this is totally redundant. If an argument is sound, that just means that it's valid and has all true premises. So this, per this person is basically saying, if an argument is valid and has all true premises, oh, and also has all true premises, and has a non-trivial conclusion, then it's a good argument, regardless of whether it persuades people. No, this is just wrong. I mean, literally all theists, for instance, think that the following argument is sound. Either God exists or 2 plus 2 equals 5. It is false that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Therefore, God exists. Right? Theists believe that this is sound. This is clearly a valid argument, right? It's either A or B. It's false that B, therefore A. Right? That's valid. 
And moreover, theists think that both the premises are true. Theists think that it's true that either God exists or 2 plus 2 equals 5, right? Because they think it's true that God exists. And whenever it's true that A, it's also true that either A or B. Theists also think that premise 2 is true, right? They agree that it's false that 2 plus 2 equals 5. So they think that this argument is sound. It has all true premises, it's formally valid, it has a non-trivial conclusion, but clearly it doesn't follow that it's a good argument by the theist's lights. This is a terrible argument. And the reason, of course, that it's terrible is that premise one is question begging. The only reason that one could have for thinking that premise one is true is a prior commitment to God's existence. And again, I mean, if you're, if you're not a theist, right, the point can be put in terms of atheists, right? You can say either God doesn't exist or 2 plus 2 equals 5. It's false that 2 plus 2 equals 5, therefore God doesn't exist. By atheists' lights, that'll be a sound argument. And yet, clearly, it's not a good argument. Like, atheists shouldn't think that it's a good argument. And I mean, similarly, like, take any argument with, like, I mean, here's, here's a premise. Earth exists. Conclusion. Earth exists. I just gave you an argument with one premise and a conclusion. The conclusion follows logically and inescapably from that premise, and the premise is true, right? So now we have a sound argument. Does that mean that this is a good argument for the conclusion that Earth exists? No, it's a terrible argument for the conclusion that God exists. Its premise is literally a restatement of the conclusion. It's question begging to the max. So it's just ludicrously absurd to say that a sound argument is automatically a good argument. Never say that. Please, never say that. And again, I mean, sometimes even professional philosophers say this. Like, it's just, what? Anyway, I need, I need to calm down. We're going on to mistake number 39, justifying a non-obvious general principle by a single example or a few examples. Now, I'm just going to say here, always be wary. Think to yourself, sure, maybe this principle is plausible when applied to some ordinary humdrum cases. But like, why should we go on to conclude that the principle holds for literally all cases whatsoever? Right? Like, what about other cases? What about cases far removed from ordinary experience? What about cases that I haven't thought of yet or that I'm maybe not even able to imagine or conceive of and so on? Just be careful. Very often people will put forward arguments with like wide ranging premises that make like a universal generalization or they say something couldn't be the case. And they'll give a few humdrum examples like from our ordinary experience to try to motivate that general principle that applies universally. But very often it's not enough to justify a non-obvious general principle by appeal to a single example or a few examples in which it seems plausible. Okay, mistake number 40, burden of proof confusions. Okay, to make a long story short, the burden of proof in a given context falls on any person who is making a claim and trying to convince others of that claim. If you make a claim and try to convince others of that claim, then you better provide others with some reason to accept that claim. Otherwise, you failed to make your case to your audience. And if you're not making any claims, well then clearly you don't have a burden of proof to justify your claims. While if you're making a claim, but you're not trying to convince others of the claim, say because all parties to the dispute already grant it, well then clearly you don't have any burden in that context to prove that the claim is true in that context. So this is a simple test for deciphering who has the burden of proof, right? Just ask, who is making a claim and trying to convince others of that claim? Notice that this means that the atheist will sometimes have a burden of proof when, for instance, they're positively claiming that God doesn't exist and are trying to convince others of that claim. Clearly, they then shoulder the burden of justifying that contention. I'm not saying that atheists always have a burden of proof. Again, who has a burden of proof? It depends by context. It depends in a given context who's making a claim and whether or not they're trying to convince others. All right, mistake number 41, ignoring the various dimensions of simplicity. So Graham Oppy, following broader philosophical work on theory comparison, distinguishes three useful dimensions of simplicity or parsimony. We're just going to go through these different kinds of simplicity because... All too often, people just kind of confuse these together in their minds. They don't adequately distinguish them. They kind of merge them together. It's an interesting question how to weigh these various dimensions of simplicity against one another, as well as how to weigh them against other theoretical virtues. But that's a topic for another day. Right here, I just want to distinguish three useful dimensions of simplicity or parsimony so that you can at least keep them conceptually distinct in your mind. Again, all of this is really just in the helps of empowering you, giving you tools to think better and think critically in the context of philosophy, and just to help everyone try to avoid these mistakes. And I'll say here that if you see value in this sort of work that I do, if you see value in trying to help people think critically, think cogently, think carefully, and think with love and truth center stage, if you see value in all that and you see value in the work that I do in trying to promote that, please consider supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation. It greatly helps through grad school and with my student debt from Purdue. Thank you to all current patrons. Much love to you guys. You guys are the wind in my sails and you get tons and tons of bonus goodies like exclusive videos, access to scripts and channel preparation, all that sort of stuff. Okay, back to mistake number 41 and ignoring the various dimensions of simplicity. So first up is ontological simplicity. All else being equal, a worldview committed to fewer things and fewer kinds of things is superior to one committed to more things and more kinds of things. And ontological simplicity can actually be broken up into quantitative ontological simplicity and qualitative ontological simplicity. You'll notice here that this is talking about a worldview being committed to 
the number of things and also the number of kinds of things that it posits, right? So quantitative ontological simplicity concerns the number of entities posited, whereas qualitative ontological simplicity concerns the number of kinds of entities posited. You can also distinguish quantitative ontological simplicity and qualitative ontological simplicity from their fundamental counterparts, right? So there's fundamental quantitative ontological simplicity. This concerns the number of fundamental entities that a theory posits. Likewise, fundamental qualitative ontological simplicity concerns the number of fundamental or basic kinds of entities posited, right? Qualitative corresponds to kinds. Ontological simplicity has to deal with the entities posited, and fundamental has to do with the number of fundamental or basic kinds of entities posited. Second up, we have ideological simplicity. All else being equal, a worldview employing fewer undefined primitive expressions is superior to one employing more undefined primitive expressions. The degree of ideological simplicity of hypothesis is determined by the number of primitive terms needed to formulate the hypothesis. So perhaps you have a mathematical theory that contains the terms set and number among its primitive terms. You then find a way to define a number in terms of set, and so your theory no longer needs to take number to be among its primitive terms. Your theory still has the same expressive resources as before, right? Your theory can still generate as many sentences as before, but your theory has become ideologically simpler by taking one less term as primitive. And finally, theoretical simplicity. All else being equal, a worldview committed to fewer and less complicated fundamental principles is superior to one committed to more and more complicated fundamental principles. Fundamental principles, by the way, are basically just postulations or claims that you make that aren't logically derivable from other postulations or claims that you make, rather that your theory makes. It's important to assess the theoretical complexity of views, since views may agree on what entities there are, but they may theoretically characterize those entities vastly differently, and some characterizations will obviously be more complex than others. For example, suppose one theory simply posits a tree and remains agnostic on its specific features, whereas another theory posits the tree and then theoretically characterizes it in a super duper complex manner. Like it's exactly 37.83921 feet tall, it was planted on a Tuesday at 4.17 p.m., etc. While both theories have only posited one entity, the tree, one theory makes lots and lots and lots of postulations about that tree that the other theory doesn't, and so it incurs lots of theoretical baggage and complexity that the other theory does away with. Anyway, the point of all this is just to be wary anytime says one theory or view or hypothesis is simpler than another. Ask, on what dimension? Ontological simplicity? Well, which elements of ontological simplicity? Are you talking about qualitative ontological simplicity, quantitative ontological simplicity, fundamental quantitative ontological simplicity, fundamental qualitative ontological simplicity? Are you talking about ideological simplicity? Are you talking about theoretical simplicity? And so on. People are often way too quick with appeals to simplicity. All right, on to mistake number 42. I want verified, peer-reviewed, empirical evidence that God exists. The only thing that plausibly motivates this is something like scientism according to which only scientific evidence can provide us with knowledge. But this is deeply mistaken, partly because scientism itself is an epistemological thesis, not a scientific thesis about the nature and limits of knowledge, and it's not itself supported by any scientific evidence, like no number of observations of pressure gauges and temperature and so on will ever reveal to you that only scientific evidence can provide us with knowledge. And so by scientism's own lights, it couldn't be known. And so it's self-undermining. And also another reason why this is deeply mistaken is that science itself rests on various beliefs that we know non-scientifically, such as that there's an external world or that our memory is generally reliable or that you're currently experiencing such and such or that our sense perception is generally reliable and so on down the list. You can't prove those scientifically because they are presuppositions of science. In order to do science, you have to rely on your memory and your perceptual experience and so on. So science itself rests on various beliefs that we know non-scientifically. And so it's mistaken to say that only scientific evidence can provide us with knowledge. And because I think that that's the only thing that could plausibly motivate this demand that there be like peer-reviewed empirical scientific evidence that God exists, I think that this demand is just thoroughly unjustified. Okay, mistake number 43, theism is unfalsifiable. Emerson Green has a nice portion of his five mistakes atheists make about epistemology on this point. I'll offer my response, which is very, very similar to Emerson Green's. I think this claim is mistaken. An unfalsifiable hypothesis is one that doesn't make any predictions, and so can be neither confirmed nor disconfirmed by data. But quite plausibly, theism does make at least some predictions in the sense that, given theism, there are certain things we'd expect more than others, and other things that we'd expect less than others. Suppose that the world is like a tortuous world, right? I mean, like, just for like hundreds of billions of years, all it is is just sentient creatures experiencing profound agony. There's no afterlife for them. This just goes on throughout all of the beginningless past, let's say, and all of the endless future. There's just an infinite amount of time in which, like, let's say, countless creatures are just experiencing nothing but 
every waking moment of their existence is pure, uninterrupted agony. Again, there's the, we're supposing, given this specification of the world, there's no afterlife for them. There are no goods that accrue to them as a result of this. It's just a pure agony world. That's all that it is. Now, if that world were to obtain, right, <laughs> that would be deeply surprising under theism. Since God, being perfectly good, would plausibly strongly desire not to actualize a world like that. And what this means is that theism strongly predicts that this is not how the world would be like. And so theism doesn't make at least some predictions. It's open to at least some confirmation and disconfirmation. This, by the way, is one of the central tasks of philosophy of religion. Firstly, to tease out theism's predictions, and secondly, to examine which of those come to pass and which don't. Many have argued that theism more strongly predicts than atheism that there wouldn't be non-resistant, non-culpable non-believers. Assuming that there are such non-believers, we have at least some evidence against theism on our hands. And so on down the list of relevant data in assessing theism's merits. So I think it's mistaken to say that theism is unfalsifiable. Also, we should keep in mind that if theism is unfalsifiable, then there can be no evidence for atheism. To be unfalsifiable is to make no predictions. But of course, if hypothesis H makes no predictions, then we can't compare how expected some piece of data is on H with how expected that piece of data is on the negation of H. But in order to get evidence for not H, we would need to compare how expected some piece of data is on not H to how expected it is under H. That's how evidence works, as I explain in my Bayes theorem video and as I've talked about throughout this video. Letting H be theism and not H be atheism, we get the result that if theism is unfalsifiable, then there can be no evidence for atheism. So atheists are potentially doing themselves a massive disservice if they claim that theism is unfalsifiable. All right, mistake number 44, intuitions don't matter, or intuitions are evidentially useless. Let's hear Emerson Green on this one because, well, I'm tired of talking. Intuitions are intellectual appearances that are non-inferential. According to humor, an intuition is a mental state in which something seems correct upon direct intellectual reflection as opposed to observation or reasoning. So a non-inferential intellectual appearance. Let's break that down a bit. Quote, there is a type of experience known as an appearance, or seeming, which is what you report when you say, it seems to me that this proposition is true. This is a mental state that represents something as being the case. It has propositional content, as philosophers say. It is distinct from a belief, but it normally causes beliefs. Under normal circumstances, you believe what seems true to you, because it seems true. End quote. There are several kinds of seemings and appearances, including sensory experiences, memory experiences, introspective awareness, and intellectual appearances. Quote, intellectual appearances are appearances that result from exercising the faculty of reason, in other words, thinking about things, as opposed to looking with your eyes, hearing with your ears, etc. Among intellectual appearances, there are two species, inferential appearances and intuitions. Inferential appearances are experiences in which some proposition seems true to you in the light of some other propositions that you already believe or already seem true to you that seemingly support that proposition. Intuitions are intellectual appearances that are not inferential. That is, they are experiences in which some proposition seems true to you on its own, rather than in light of something else. End quote. So we certainly cannot dispense with the idea that appearances can provide some degree of justification, since tossing that out would mean tossing out our sense data, memories, and so on. And we can't dispense with intellectual appearances either, since any rational being is going to be relying on intellectual seemings and appearances as they are working through arguments, evaluating evidence, making inferences, just generally exercising the faculty of reason. So on what grounds can we say that this one particular kind of intellectual appearance non-inferential intellectual seemings, can't be trusted. What principled reason can we give to include sensory appearances but exclude intellectual appearances, or include inferential appearances but not non-inferential appearances? I remember hearing Sam Harris years ago on a podcast say that anyone would be at pains to justify basic mathematical or logical truths without just an appeal to intuition. I remember this making me uncomfortable. Intuition seemed like such a thin basis for something so important. But the more I read about epistemology, the less it bothered me. Intuition is absolutely indispensable. We use it all the time. If you were to actually reject intuition wholesale, an enormous number of very obvious beliefs would vanish, and presumably everything based on them as well. Mm -hmm.
There are these intellectual seemings, these intuitions, and um, they often lead us astray. So some people want to, like, you know, like you mentioned, they're, they're probably not thinking this all the way through, but they want to, like, reject the uh, legitimacy of intuitions altogether, think they just, like, are irrelevant or don't really count very much. So, um, but our intuitions do often, like, mislead us, like, uh, with probability or um, physical science. So, you know, science often leads us to these counterintuitive conclusions. So shouldn't that cast doubt on the trustworthiness of our intuitions? Um, no. <laughs> well, yeah, so you, um, you can cast doubt on specific intuitions. I don't think you can cast doubt on intuition in general, such that like, you know, like, like you would reject any and all intuitions. And I think the people who are saying that are badly confused. They're just like, you know, pathetically confused, right? So, you know, to try to bring out the confusion, right? Like, oh, okay, so I've heard that people have bad intuitions about probability, so don't listen to your intuitions about probability, right? Okay, and like, and how do you know that those intuitions are bad? How, how can we show this, okay? So let's think about this. So one of the errors that people are supposed to make is the conjunction fallacy. Like they've done... Um, They've done these psychology studies where somebody, they, you can get a scenario in which somebody will judge a conjunction to be more probable than the first conjunct. And that is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. But wait, how do we know that that's wrong? How do you know that the probability of a conjunction is less than the probability of the first conjunct? Oh, we know that from probability theory. Like, yeah, okay, what about it? Like, we know that from the Kolmogorov axioms of probability. Like you can deduce that the probability of a conjunction is less than or equal to, okay? How, and how do we know the Kolmogorov axioms are true? Right? Like the person who's doing this experiment to say that people are bad at probabilistic reasoning is assuming that he himself can do probabilistic reasoning. How can he do that? Well, he can do that because he grasps the axioms, like the Kolmogorov axioms of probability, which are self-evident. Guess what? That's an intuition. <laughs> Yeah, you're appealing to intuitions. Yeah, I, I think some people really don't appreciate how much of our intellectual life is just based on intuition. Like you said, like these kind of, you know, mathematical axioms or these like foundational mathematical truths. These things do just seem to like bottom out in like brute intuitions when it comes to like math or logic. None of this is to suggest that intuition can't be wrong. Part of the appeal of humor's appearance-based account of intuition is that it easily accommodates the fact that our intuition can be wrong, and that we sometimes don't believe what initially seems to us to be the case, since appearances can be misleading. And yet, still, it makes no sense whatsoever to say that you categorically don't trust intuition. You do, whether you realize it or not. And that's fine, there's nothing irrational about trusting intuition. The least reasonable people in this conversation are the ones who are claiming to reject intuition altogether. No one really across the board rejects intuition as a source of justification. The divide is not between people who don't rely on intuition and people who do. The divide is between people who realize they rely on intuition and people who don't. All right, and for more on all this stuff, you can see my video, Intuition and Analysis. All right, on a mistake number 45, that is so speculative. Or, in other words, misunderstanding the distinction between undercutting and rebutting defeaters. So on one of my critiques of stage two of the Kalam cosmological argument, I was bringing up epistemic possibilities for what the first cause might be such that they're non-theistic. So I was bringing up epistemic possibilities like, hey, for all we know and for all the proponents of stage two have argued, the cause of the universe might be something like Alyssa Nays and Jill North and Julian Barber's and so on, their conception of the non-spatiotemporal universal wave function and various other proposals. Now, some people responded in the comment section like, well, that's just so speculative. and ugh. But that is to misunderstand the nature of the criticism that we are offering. The nature of the criticism that was being offered was that in order to infer that the first cause is God, one would have to rule out that the first cause is one of these non-theistic epistemic possibilities. And so if one fails to rule those out, if one doesn't give us any reason whatsoever thinking that these are not the case, well, then one will have failed to justify the conclusion that the first cause is God. I wasn't there to offer positive justification for thinking that the first cause really is this non spatial double universal wave function, say, or some other non-theistic reality. That would be to offer a rebutting defeater for the claim that the cause of the universe is or must be God. 
No, instead I was offering an undercutting to feeder. I was simply attempting to remove their justification for thinking that it's God by providing alternative epistemic possibilities for what a first cause might be, possibilities that they haven't ruled out, but which they would need to rule out in order for their inference to God to succeed. So the fact that the proposals are speculative is utterly irrelevant to the criticism at hand. And also as if they're any more speculative than positing a disembodied supernatural mind, but set that aside. So yeah, anyway, here are some general comments about this. Undercutting defeaters for some claim are considerations that remove the justification for that claim, or else show that it never had any justification to begin with. By contrast, rebutting defeaters for some claim are considerations that provide direct grounds for thinking that that claim is false. All right, mistake number 46, thinking that everything requires an argument for us to be justified in believing it. No, that's not true. If it were true, we wouldn't be justified in believing anything. And the reason is that that would require an infinite regress of arguments to be justified in accepting literally anything, which is absurd, right? I mean, if we had to offer an argument for everything we believe, including the premises of that argument and the premises of those arguments and so on forever, then we wouldn't be rational in holding any of our beliefs since we don't offer infinitely many arguments for our beliefs and can't do that. But of course, we are rational in accepting many of our beliefs. And so what that follows is that there are at least some things that we believe for which we don't need an argument to be justified in believing them. All right, on to the behavior portion of this video. These are just mistakes pertaining to people's behavior and dispositions and other things like that. So mistake number 47, a general lack of epistemic humility. This is a mistake that we all succumb to, some more than others, of course, but it sadly afflicts humans in general. Nevertheless, there are ways to try to minimize and mitigate and fight back against excessive confidence and lack of humility. A few ways include reflecting on and owning up to your limitations, right? recognizing that there are probably lots of reasons against your beliefs and against positions that you hold of which you're probably unaware and haven't yet come across, recognizing that there are people who have studied the topic more than you and yet who disagree with you, recognizing that you're a fallible human being who has made mistakes in the past and may very well be mistaken on your current beliefs and positions, so just recognizing your various limitations, the limitations in your reasoning abilities, the limitations in the extent of the reasons bearing on a question of which you're aware compared to the extent of reasons that there are that actually bear on the question, and just limitations deriving from your particular situatedness. And like you lack a lot of evidence that other people have just because other people have read different books, read different articles, watched different videos, have different bodies of testimonial evidence, may have different intuitions, have thought of and considered different reasons and objections and arguments, have assessed them differently, etc. This also brings us to perspective taking, really trying to envisage someone else's point of view and seeing how they are coming at an issue and trying to recognize and appreciate the intellectual backdrop behind positions and trying to appreciate why someone might see things differently than you and just trying to intellectually empathize in that manner. Also ditching the echo chambers. Right, An echo chamber is a community that actively discredits relevant outside voices, whereas an epistemic bubble is a community that excludes relevant voices by omission. So for instance, a lot of people will just surround themselves with only conservative media. Sometimes that will just be an epistemic bubble. They'll just be excluding relevant voices like liberal voices by omission. But other times they'll find themselves in a far more pernicious epistemic community, which is a community that actively discredits the relevant outside voices. It tells you that, oh, the liberals, you can't trust them and that you can only trust the people within our in-group and so on. So trying to find ways to get out of echo chambers and to really try to take seriously and empathize with alternative points of view and hearing things from other people's perspectives, that'll also help curb excessive confidence and lack of humility. All right, mistake number 48, which is a binary attitude. This one is very pernicious. So many people, it baffles me, but I've seen it so much. Like among like people like Frank Turek, you know, they'll just, it's like basically Christian theism for them or like a reductive materialistic naturalistic atheism. It's just like, how have you gotten to such a narrow binary attitude? It boggles my mind. But anyway, try to rid yourself of these sorts of binary attitudes where you're thinking that the only two worldviews that could be true are theism or materialism, or like Christianity or atheism, or like divine simplicity or atheism, or like substance dualism or reductive physicalism. You know, someone will be like, someone will try to argue. You'll hear, you'll often hear like apologists argue against a kind of eliminativist or reductionistic physicalism. And then they'll try to conclude that that's like victory for substance dualism when they're ignoring so many other sorts of views. Neutral monism, panpsychism, property dualism, non-reductive physicalism, epiphenomenalism, etc. Or like moral realism or moral nihilism, you know? Either there are stance independent moral truths or there are literally no moral truths whatsoever. Or like biblical inerrancy or Christianity is false. So people think that if you can show that biblical inerrancy is false, then just the falsity of Christianity follows. Again, they're just failing to recognize intermediate views, various different views that one can take on these topics. Binary attitudes afflict everyone. And it's just try 
to recognize when you are falling into one of these binary attitudes and try to correct for it. And recognize when other people are doing so as well and try to point it out. All right, mistake number 49, psychologizing, you know, saying things like theists believe only for emotional reasons, atheists disbelieve for immoral reasons, etc. These sorts of psychologizing tactics are generally done without sufficient evidence. They alienate others, they make others defensive, and they thereby prevent the fruitful exchange of ideas between people. They diminish your intellectual empathy, they make you less receptive to the criticisms of other sorts of people. As I say here, they can prevent you from being properly attentive to potential counter evidence. It's really just a recipe for creating an echo chamber. You're actively discrediting opposing viewpoints, thereby cementing people in their current beliefs and inoculating them against legitimate criticisms and problems. As an aggregate structure, your social network will lack what philosopher Sandy Goldberg in his book Relying on Others calls coverage reliability. Your network, in other words, won't deliver to you a sufficiently broad and representative coverage of all the relevant information. This is what happens when you actively downplay the views, the testimony, the epistemic input from people outside of your tribe. You'll tend to miss out on contrary views and run into exaggerated degrees of agreement. And the, again, these sorts of epistemic bubbles that I was mentioning earlier and that are coming up here, they also threaten us with a danger of excessive self-confidence. In such bubbles, we will encounter exaggerated amounts of agreement and suppressed levels of disagreement. And we're therefore vulnerable because in general, we actually have very good reason to pay attention to whether other people agree or disagree with us. Looking to others for corroboration is a basic method for checking whether one is reasoned well or badly. And so if you're only surrounding yourself with people who agree with you, you can get a false sense of self-confidence and security. All right, mistake number 50, another behavioral mistake, which is failures of objectivity. Objectivity, like all other intellectual virtues, is part of rationality. The character trait of objectivity is a disposition to resist bias and hence to base one's beliefs on reasons and evidence. The main failures of objectivity are cases where your beliefs are overly influenced by your personal interests, emotions, or desires, or by how the phenomenon in the world is related to you as opposed to how the external world is independent of you. And note that objectivity is not to be confused with neutrality. People very often confuse those. When you're being objective, you give the relevant views a fair hearing. You consider and present the case for them as strongly as you can in terms that are faithful to their proponents' intellectual motivations. You don't selectively attend to evidence, you don't distort people's words, and you don't use any other tricks that skew the assessment of the views in question. This is what objectivity consists in. That's different from being neutral. Right? In a neutral presentation of the issues, you're not taking sides at all. Right? You're simply reporting other people's ideas without any evaluation. But you can be non-neutral, that is, you can take a stance on the question, and still be objective or fair in your assessment of the relevant views. So don't confuse objectivity with neutrality. Once more, on this point, we're going to be turning to Michael Humer's Knowledge, Reality, and Value to get some pretty good insights on this, these points about objectivity. When responding to opposing views, you should respond to the most plausible opposing views and address the strongest arguments for those views. That is, the views and arguments that have the greatest chance of being correct while being importantly different from your own view. When you explain what your opponents think, and notice that it's quote-unquote opponents, right? I mean, like, it actually can be harmful to frame these discussions in terms of, like, opponents. You can see how that fosters a kind of tribalism and us-versus-them thinking. Instead, they're your dialectical partners with whom you're trying to discover the truth. But anyway, when you explain what your quote-unquote opponents think, try to state their views in the way that they themselves would state them. If there is any ambiguity in your opponents' statements, choose the most reasonable interpretation of their words. Acknowledge the evidence that genuinely supports their side and do not exaggerate the evidence for your side. All of this is being objective. Now, you might wonder, if I do that, then how am I going to win debates? Well, if you have this concern, you're thinking incorrectly about intellectual discussion. The purpose of intellectual discussion is promoting truth for yourself and others. If your view can't survive when you treat the opposing views fairly, then that pretty much means your view is wrong. As a rational thinker, you want to have true beliefs, so you should welcome the opportunity to discover if your own current view is wrong. Then you can eliminate a mistaken belief and move closer to the truth. If you are afraid to confront the strongest opposing views, represented in the fairest way possible, that means that you suspect that your own beliefs are not up to the challenge, which means you already suspect that your beliefs are false. Nobody learns much from discussions in which two people unfairly caricature each other's views, distort the evidence, and try to paper over the problems in their own views. When two people with opposing beliefs argue things out while treating each other fairly and objectively, that is when people learn. If you're talking to another person one-on-one, -on -one, you will likely learn from each other and reach a more satisfying understanding, even if you don't actually resolve the central disagreement. If you're having a public discussion, as in an internet discussion forum, the audience is also likely to be educated. Since you want to learn and promote others' as learning, you should try to have the kind of discussion filled with fair, objective treatments of one another, not the kind filled with distortions and evasions. Objectivity is important because failures of objectivity are very common, and they often lead us very far astray. 
the main thing human beings need to make progress on debates in philosophy and religion and politics is more objectivity. The human mind is not really designed for discovering abstract philosophical truths. Our natural tendency is to try to advance our own interests or the interests of the group we identify with, and we tend to treat intellectual issues as a proxy battleground for that endeavor. Again, we generally don't expressly decide to do this. We do it automatically unless we are making a concerted conscious effort not to do so. And naturally, when we do this, we form all sorts of false beliefs because reality does not adjust itself to whatever is convenient for a particular social faction. As Humer suggested above, one reason for treating opposing views fairly is that you yourself might be wrong, particularly if you're afraid to treat opposing views fairly. Another reason is that even if your central view is correct, you can often learn something from people with opposing views. It is very rare that some view held by intelligent people has absolutely nothing to it, captures no important facts, responds to no relevant aspect of reality. Probably, if someone reasonably smart disagrees with you, they know some relevant information that explains why they have their opposing view. Taking account of that information is likely to make your own view more sophisticated and accurate. At the very least, you can better understand how other people think. Finally, by treating opposing views fairly, you're more likely to be persuasive. If you're arguing with another person and you distort their views or respond to only the weakest arguments for their views, then they won't be persuaded, right? To be persuaded, the other person has to feel that you understood what they were trying to say and that you rebutted the strongest reasons that support their view. And of course, when you talk to other people about philosophy, the other people often do a less than ideal job of explaining their own view. So sometimes you actually have to work to give their view a better presentation than they themselves gave it before you rebut it. And finally, Humor goes through some really nice tips about how to be objective, how we can work to be more objective, and he says there are three main steps that he recommends at least. First is to identify your biases. Just being aware of a bias makes that bias less influential. For instance, if you're an educator and you believe that educators should be paid more money, acknowledge the fact that you could be biased because of your self-interest. If you're thinking about a controversial issue and it makes you emotional, acknowledge the fact that your emotions could be clouding your judgment. The second step is to diversify your information sources. When you learn about an issue, do not just learn from people who you agree with. Gather information and ideas from people on different sides. For example, if you want to learn about gun control, collect information from both pro and anti-gun sources. Also, by the way, collect information from the most sophisticated sources, not, as most people do, the most entertaining sources. That usually means looking at academic sources rather than popular media. And this is just a general point about reliability, not specifically about objectivity. And then the third way to help improve your objectivity is to challenge yourself. When you think about a controversial issue, do not just try to think of reasons why other people are wrong and you're right. Try to think of reasons why your own views might be wrong. When you give an argument, ask yourself at each major step, is there anything that could be wrong with this step? Spend some time trying to think of evidence against your own conclusions, right? Try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Whenever you're giving an argument for theism or for atheism, try to put yourself in the theist shoes or the atheist shoes and ask, how would they respond to this argument? How would Grimapi respond to this argument? How would Josh Rasmussen respond to this argument, etc.? Note, if you hold a controversial view and you haven't thought of any objections to it, think more. If the only objections you can think of are really stupid, think more. Because the best explanation for your not knowing of any good objections to your view is not that you're completely correct. The best explanation is that you're too blinded by bias to have seen the problems with your view. Okay, on to mistake number 51, being a bad philosophical discussant. And once more, we're going to go to humor's knowledge, reality, and value. So here are some principles for being a good philosophical discussant. People flagrantly violate these all the time, and it's kind of frustrating. So let's go through these. First, be cooperative, okay? When discussing philosophy, your aim is to make progress in the discussion, not to cause delays or score points or prevent other people in discussion from making their points or to sow chaos. This implies a number of more specific things, right? Firstly, accept the hypothetical, okay? If someone gives a hypothetical example, don't raise objections to the example that will only make your interlocutor waste time thinking of other examples or thinking of a series of increasingly elaborate modifications. Do not start a debate about how realistic the example is or what would really happen in a situation of that kind. Just accept the examples as the other person intends it. Usually they're just simply trying to make like an ethical point. They're not saying, and their point doesn't require very often, that the situation be realistic. Also be charitable, right? If anything is ambiguous in what the other person is saying, don't search for the stupidest thing that they might be saying. Search for the most reasonable thing that they might be saying. Don't quibble and just try to see the point. Don't just focus on making your own points and don't just try to stop the other person from making their point. Try to see the main point that the other person is getting at. Try to actively listen to them and really try to understand where they're coming from. Next up is be modest. Not everything that seems obvious to you is right. In fact, when it comes to abstract philosophical questions, probably most of the thoughts that occur to you, even the ones that seem obviously right to you, are wrong. The way that we know this is that the things that seem obvious to people very often conflict with each other, so the percentage of things that seem obvious that are actually true must be pretty low. Thinking well in philosophy requires being much 
much more careful than people are naturally inclined to be. And so he gives some specific suggestions. Use weak, widely shared premises. Right? A strong claim is one that says quite a lot, and it demands a lot of the world, and it demands you to accept quite a lot. Whereas a weak claim doesn't say very much. It's much more modest. Try to use weak, widely shared premises. Don't assume things. If something another person has said is ambiguous or unclear, don't assume that you have the right interpretation. Usually you don't. Ask for clarification at the outset. We all fail at this, right? I fail at this. But again, this is a work in progress for all of us. We're all trying to get better at this. Also, know when to use the same word and be very careful with your words. In philosophy, we often need to rely on subtle distinctions, which we mark with slightly different words. Because this happens a lot, you have to be careful about using words. If you use one word to talk about something, and then you shift to it using a different word that sounds to you like a synonym to talk about the same thing, this can cause confusion. Readers or listeners might think that you're trying to make one of these subtle distinctions. So if you're talking about one thing, keep consistent usage of the same word. Okay, so those are all some tips on being a good philosophical discussant. And now we're on to mistake number 52. Speak for your own intuitions. So very often I'll hear people say, and I myself have said in the past as well, things like, it is obvious that P, or we intuitively think that P, or like the common sense view is that blank, etc. Now, these sorts of claims are not always bad, but very often they're bad, and you need to be very careful when you're making them. Like, it is obvious that P, or we intuitively think that P. Okay. It's obvious to whom that P, right? I mean, like, obviousness is not some, like, abstract property that attaches to propositions. No, it's always obvious to someone or to some group of people, right? So if you're saying it's obvious that P, right? I mean, who are you talking about? Are you saying it's obvious to literally all people? What if I don't share your intuition there? It's not obvious to me. So why are you saying it is obvious that P? Are you saying that it's obvious to most people? Okay, I mean, that's an empirical claim. Where's your evidence for thinking that it's obvious to most people? Again, I'm not saying that there's no evidence or that you can't wield any such evidence, but if you're going to say it's obvious to most people that P, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and give us some reason to think that that really is the case. Are you talking about people in your linguistic community, people in your society or culture, people who have reflected on the topic? Are you just talking about yourself, your own intuitions? Try to specify this, right? It is woefully underspecified when you say it is obvious that P, or like, intu like we intuitively think that P, et cetera. And in general, in having conversations with people, especially about controversial topics, and especially in contexts like philosophy where... There's oftentimes intuition disagreement. I recommend speaking for your own intuitions as a general rule of thumb. Try to get in the habit of saying, well, it's obvious to me that P, or it seems really clear to me that P. In that case, you're not presuming anything about the other person's intuitions. You're not presuming anything about the extent to which your personal intuitions are shared by the public at large or shared by people who've reflected on the topic, etc. It's really a point about modesty. And again, note that you don't always need to do this, right? Since one, often you can be practically certain that your audience will share the intuition, and two, it may already be understood that you're reporting your own intuitions on the matter, in which case it would be unnecessary to continually add things like to me, to me, to me. And there are also other qualifications, okay? So again, I'm not saying that you always need to do this. My point is just that at least many times, you can't or shouldn't be practically certain that your audience will share it. And it may not be understood by all parties that you're reporting your own intuitions on the matter. In such cases, and perhaps when some other conditions are met, I recommend using things like that's intuitive to me, or that's obvious to me, or that's clear to me, etc. All right, mistake number 53. Philosophy never makes progress. Philosophers are still debating the same things they were debating 2,000 years ago. Again, we're going to be looking at Humor's Knowledge, Reality, and Value because he addresses this point on pages 25 to 26. So here's this myth. Philosophy never makes progress. Philosophers are still debating the same things they were debating 2,000 years ago. He says, no, that's completely false on debating the same questions. Like, here are some things that philosophers are not debating 2,000 years ago. Criteria of ontological commitment, modal realism, reliabilism, semantic externalism, paraconsistent logic, functionalism, expressivist metaethics. Now, you might not know what any of those are, but those are all well-known and important topics in contemporary philosophy, which any philosophy professor will recognize, and none of them was discussed by Plato or Aristotle or any other ancient philosopher. Though Western philosophy has been around for 2,000 years, none of those issues, to the best of my knowledge, was ever discussed by anyone at more than 100 years ago. And having seen that list, any professional philosopher could now extend it with many more examples. Regarding progress, well, here are some questions on which we've made philosophical progress. Is slavery just? <laughs> no joke. Aristotle, often considered history's greatest philosopher, thought slavery was just, and he actually tried to give arguments for it. They're, they're not good arguments, they're bad arguments. No one thinks this anymore, of course. Or which is better, dictatorship or democracy? Seriously, Plato, also considered one of history's greatest philosophers, thought the answer was dictatorship, as long as the dictator is a philosopher king. No one thinks that anymore. Is homosexuality wrong? Historically, philosophers and non-philosophers alike held different views on this question, with many thinking homosexuality was morally wrong, including such great philosophers as Thomas Aquinas and Immanuel Kant. Today, almost everyone, I would say here, almost everyone in Western societies, as well as almost every professional philosopher, agrees that homosexuality is obviously fine. 
and he goes through several more like teleology, knowledge, etc. And he says that none of these are minor cases, like these are all significant changes on important issues. Granted, in some cases, philosophical progress consists in rejecting an old view about a question without achieving a consensus on the correct view. But rejecting false views is an important kind of progress. Have we found the answers to every question? Obviously not. But have we made important progress? Clearly, yes. All right, mistake number 54, philosophy is useless. So first up, suppose that that's true. It's not, as I'm about to explain, but suppose that that's true. So what? Right? If you want to draw any normative or epistemological conclusion from that, such as that we should therefore stop doing it, or stop teaching it, or that it cannot produce any knowledge, well then congratulations, right? you're doing philosophy. If, for instance, you think philosophy cannot produce any knowledge, then your philosophical reasoning here cannot produce any knowledge, and your argument subverts itself. But in any case, it isn't true that philosophy is useless, and only those uninformed about its goings-on would make such a statement. There are, for starters, lots of personal intellectual benefits that philosophy cultivates. Critical thinking skills, better abilities to detect bullshit, analytical writing and reading, parsing difficult texts, formulating and assessing the reasoning contained in arguments, seeing whether people's conclusions actually follow from their premises, pinpointing underlying or implicit assumptions, making distinctions that clarify and precisify debates, and so on down the list. All of this translates nicely into various practical benefits, such as scoring very well on the LSAT, GRE, and things like that. And in fact, philosophy majors perform substantially better than average for each of these standard tests for admission to graduate school, and not a single other group of majors shows such consistent high level of achievement. This indicates a high level of general skills sought after by employers too, right? The ability to think rigorously, express oneself clearly, analyze situations and arguments, and come up with creative solutions to problems, and being able to map out those solutions and their pros and cons. Philosophy also helps us better inform our moral and political views, which in turn helps us live better lives. For instance, by helping us decipher whether it's moral or immoral to eat meat, to refrain from donating most of our income to charity, to lock people up in prison, to have an abortion, to uphold a system of private ownership of the means of production, and so on down the list. Philosophy as a discipline also has various benefits. And here we're going to listen to some portions of Graham Priest's talk on the nature of philosophy and his place in the university. There are two very important aspects of philosophy that Passmore's account throws into prominence. The first is that philosophy is essentially critical. And this is the first point I'm going to flag. This is one of the things that distinguishes philosophy from religion, politics, and normal science, in the sense of uh, Tom Kuhn, the historian of science. Nothing is sacrosanct. Everything is fair game for challenge. It must defend itself or go under. The second aspect that Passmore's account throws into prominence is that philosophy has a symbiotic relationship with other disciplines. It draws many of its central issues from other areas, such as physics, psychology, law, literature, and so on. And in return, it provides for them a critique of their methods, canons of argument, and fundamental beliefs, which spur on the long-term development of those subjects. But despite these things, I think that Passmore, Passmore's account is wrong. It takes account of what we might call the analytic side of philosophy, that is, its critical and evaluative aspects, but it ignores what we might call the synthetic side, because philosophy is also a strongly imaginative and creative subject, and this is the second point that I flag. Philosophers have produced some of the most ingenious and important theories in Western thought. Sometimes the theories become, deservedly or undeservedly, mere history. More importantly, sometimes the theories are taken up by later disciplines to provide bases for important developments. Thus, in science, atomism and positivism. Positivism played an important role in both the special theory of relativity and psychological behaviorism. Both these things, uh, atomism and positivism, to name just a couple from a long list, were first thought of by philosophers. In politics, the ideas of Hobbes, Locke and Marx have all been made the bases of political systems. In art, the Romantic movement of the 19th century owed much to the Romantic philosophy of Rousseau, Coleridge, and others. And so it goes on. Indeed, as Passmore himself said in a recent interview in the Bulletin, uh, and I quote, almost all the ideas which we now take for granted came from philosophy. To understand the other illuminating but incorrect account of philosophy that I want to talk about, it is necessary to look at the historical development of Western thought. It's a striking fact that philosophy is the area out of which nearly all other more specialised intellectual inquiries that we now recognise sprang. And this is the third point that I flag. They each broke away from philosophy 
when they develop specialised methods appropriate to dealing with the objects of their inquiry. Mathematics was the first to break away in about the 3rd century BC. Pythagoras was as much philosopher as mathematician. Euclid was not. Astronomy broke away about the 2nd century AD with Ptolemy. Physics and the other natural sciences broke away in the early 17th century at the times of Galileo and Descartes. And sociology, psychology, economics and so on broke away in the 19th century. And so it went. We are currently witnessing philosophy give birth to literary theory. And what subjects will follow is anyone's guess. It's interesting to note that logic, which could have broken away at any time after the 3rd century BC, has retained its central locus in philosophy, despite its forging alliances with other disciplines. The fact that philosophy has given birth to most other theoretical inquiries cannot provide the basis of a definition of philosophy. It's a fact that it itself cries out for explanation, presumably in terms of the nature of philosophy. So far, then, in the search for a definition of philosophy, we've drawn a blank. We've already seen enough, however, for me to take up the secondary theme of this lecture, the role of the philosophy, the role of philosophy in a university, to which I now turn. Universities have three prime functions and, correlatively, three prime responsibilities. And I shall argue that philosophy is important, indeed essential, to each of these. The first is research. The first function of a university is to research and the correlative responsibility is to the subject researched. There's no older academic discipline than philosophy. This has always been a prime area of research in universities. Moreover, it's important to remember that universities now bear the sole responsibility for research in philosophy. Gone are the days when either the church or private incomes provided for the livelihood of philosophers. If the universities of the world closed their philosophy departments, philosophy wouldn't cease. The fascination of the human mind for some of the most profound problems that can be posed will ever outstrip local institutional arrangements. However, organised research in philosophy would cease. For this reason, if no other, universities have a responsibility to ensure the existence of thriving philosophy departments. However, the importance of research in philosophy far outstrips its own local confines. As I pointed out, historically, Philosophy has functioned as the mother of theoretical inquiries, giving birth to them all. If we wish new areas or disciplines to emerge, and there is no reason to smugly assume that all that there can be already are, research in philosophy is essential to provide the matrix out of which they may arise. Secondly, and as I've already noted, research in special areas, once they have evolved, does not decouple itself from philosophy. Fundamental problems are thrown back to philosophy for analysis, and philosophers are in the ideal position to perform this service. First, because of their training in critical scrutiny. Secondly, because they're willing to question things which practitioners of the special areas are not themselves prepared to question at that time. And third, because they're prepared to suggest fruitful, speculative ideas that someone deeply ingrained in the subject is unlikely to countenance. The historian of science, Tom Kuhn, I've already mentioned, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, observed that philosophy has played an important role in all the revolutions in the natural sciences. His point would have been equally valid for revolutions in psychology, politics, or whatnot. The second function of a university is to teach, and the correlative responsibility is to its students. In one respect, this is but a corollary of the previous function. You can't have research in a subject unless you train researchers. However, few people who are undergraduates at this university or any other will become researchers. What then are they doing here? Part of the answer is that they're here to absorb a body of information, which they'll go then out into the wider world and apply. But this is only a part of the story, however, and a smaller part than many would think. If this were all their words teaching, there will be a much more cost-effective way of going about it. We could just create a battery hen university. The rest of the story is that universities should produce thoughtful, mature, rational, well-rounded people who are capable of living their lives to the full and enriching those of others. If someone can leave a university without having had the opportunity to think about the existence of God, various moral problems, such as abortion, the rights and wrongs of the political system in which they live, the nature of the physical universe in which they live, in short, in philosophy, then that university has failed its students. 
in an ideal world, all students would perhaps take courses which require them to think about these issues. However, this is not an ideal world, as I need hardly remind you. Time is a scarce commodity, but even in a less than ideal world, students may attend open discussions, seminars, debates on these issues, provided only that they are available. And they should be available in any university worth its salt. There was a debate in the uh, correspondence columns of the Australian about six months ago on whether the new universities being renamed in Australia are real universities. And the centre of the debate seemed to have become whether or not they could be real universities without any philosophical presence. And there was uh, a letter from one of the heads of these institutions, whom I now forget, who pointed out that real universities didn't need to have a philosophical presence because there were some quite bona fide universities which didn't have a philosophical presence. For example, there was the um, University of Padua in the uh, 12th century. <laughs> Pipe made. Thus, philosophy should play an integral role in both the formal and the informal education life of a university. The third function of a university is to be the locus of certain social resources. And the correlative responsibility is to society. In a sense, this too is a corollary of the previous point. As I said then, it is a function of a university to produce people who can enrich the lives of others, and doing so is precisely fulfilling one's responsibilities to society. This is done in many ways, and I attempt no exhaustive list. But first, People at universities are able to help others appreciate their cultural heritage, be this philosophy, literature, or science. Secondly, they can actually create this cultural heritage. Amongst the humanities, philosophy is quite unique in this respect. Writers are rarely to be found in English departments. Few people in music departments are composers. But with few exceptions, creative philosophers are found in and only in university philosophy departments. Next, people at universities have an important role to play in social commentary and criticism, be this through the media, government commissions, moves for social and legal reform, and so on. Now, philosophers have an important role to play in these things, for usually they've thought about the issues professionally and, just as importantly, have no special interests to protect. Moreover, they're good social critics for exactly the same reasons that they're good critics in general. They have both highly developed critical skills and are prepared to float novel ideas. Of course, this may make them unpopular sometimes. I've yet to see a government that welcomed criticism, which is why the independence of the universities from outside power groups, most notably the government, is absolutely crucial to fulfilling this social role. Okay, getting back to our script, it's well known that philosophy has given birth to lots of other fields once we reached consensus on the relevant methods for investigating the relevant domain. Significant parts of what we now call science was once natural philosophy. Economics, psychology, computer science, and boatloads of other fields branched off from philosophy relatively recently, in fact. For instance, the theoretical basis for computing was worked out by logicians, such as Gödel and Church, before the first electronic computer was even thought of. There's also tons of interdisciplinary work happening right now between philosophers, scientists, engineers, and many others as regards AI, between philosophers of physics and physicists about the foundations of quantum mechanics and relativity. For instance, there's tons of collaboration between physicists and philosophers of physics like David Albert, Barry Lower, and lots of others. Philosophers play integral roles in lots of interdisciplinary scientific research. The Free Will Show, in fact, had a whole season of their excellent podcast dedicated to free will and science. And they brought on lots of scientists and philosophers talking about their joint work on scientific research on free will. And now philosophers have played a key role in this scientific research. Philosophers play integral roles in lots of psychological research, too, such as working closely with famous psychologists Paul Bloom, David Pizarro, and so many more. Also, philosophy is pretty important for science, in particular, not only for lots of the reasons previously mentioned, right? I mean, like it helps significantly in assessing any argument, whether inside or outside science. It helps in pinpointing any implicit assumptions in lines of reasoning, etc. It helps to very clearly and precisely articulate distinctions that are used within scientific debates, as well as that are used within, for instance, survey research. But also, philosophy is pretty important for science because values play a huge role in science. And philosophy, specifically ethics, is needed to examine these evaluative questions. Right? For more on values in science, I recommend checking out Kane B's excellent video on values in science. There are evaluative questions relating to scientific funding, to the applications of scientific findings, to scientific experimentation, for instance, the extent of permissible experimentation on humans, non-human animals, etc., and so much more. 
Like there are various evaluative questions pertaining to what should we fund? There's a reason there are philosophers on ethics review boards for scientific experiments. To properly engage all these evaluative questions in science, we need good ethical reasoning. In other words, we need good philosophy, as ethics is a subfield of philosophy. Another thing Priest doesn't mention is that philosophy is needed if only because there's lots of bad reasoning and mistaken philosophy out there, which needs good philosophy to serve as a corrective. If you think, for instance, that advancing transgender rights, expanding access to gender-affirming healthcare, etc. is a good thing, then you'll need good philosophy to address those who raise philosophical objections to your pro-transgender stances, such as objections based on the alleged nature of gender, sex, identity, social construction, and whatnot. Similarly, if you think advancing transgender rights, expanding access to gender-affirming healthcare, etc. is a bad thing, then you'll need good philosophy to address those who raise philosophical objections to your anti-transgender stances, such as objections based, again, on the alleged nature of gender, sex, identity, social construction, and whatnot. So, in summary, even if we suppose that philosophy is useless, people are generally going to be using philosophy to draw conclusions on the basis of that, and so they're kind of subverting their own argument, that's what they're going to be tending to do. But in any case, it's simply false that philosophy is useless. There are tons of personal intellectual benefits that it cultivates in terms of reasoning and critical thinking skills, analytical reading and writing, and in general, just gaining lots of transferable skills, scoring well on the LSAT and GRE and so on. There are benefits in terms of informing our moral and political views, which help us live better lives. Philosophy has been integral in giving birth to lots of other disciplines like computer science, psychology, economics, science itself. Philosophy and philosophers play key roles in lots of interdisciplinary work with regard to AI, the foundations of quantum mechanics and relativity, Empirical research on free will, empirical research on cognition, moral judgment, moral psychology. Yet another reason philosophy is important for science is because values play a huge role in science with respect to what should get funding, with respect to how we should apply certain scientific findings, with respect to permissible scientific experimentation, and so on. These are all ethical questions which fall under the banner of philosophy. And finally, philosophy is needed if only because there's tons of bad reasoning and mistaken philosophy out there. Oh, and also, it's just pretty fun. And fun things are fun, aren't they? I mean, well, you're going to say, like, soccer is useless. And, like, okay, I mean, like, even supposing that it is, it's fun. I'm going to do it. I don't care if it doesn't really serve a practical use. And perhaps being fun is itself a kind of utility. Likewise, at least for me, I find Fosse fun. And if you're watching this, you probably do too. And if not, I hope the wonders of the majesty of reason can help you at least find some fun in it. And finally, on this point about philosophy's utility, I highly recommend Friction Philosophy's video, What is the Value of Philosophy? It's basically like an interview supercut with tons of different philosophers just kind of off the cuff, giving what they think is the value of philosophy. They, they raise tons of considerations that I don't even raise in here. I also recommend Bertrand Russell's lecture on the value of philosophy and Graham Priest's full lecture on the nature of philosophy and its role in the university, clips of which I played earlier. All of these can be found in my Doing Philosophy playlist. All right, and that's all she wrote for part one of this seven-part series on common mistakes that people make in the philosophy and religion sphere. Thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned for parts two through seven. And I'm also going to be making some clips with respect to individual mistakes that I think are particularly problematic and particularly interesting. So you're going to get lots of fun, majesty of reason content out of all this. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please smash that like button. That really does help put the video out there. Drop your thoughts down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear them. Turn on that little bell so you get notified when these videos come out. If you like, please consider supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation. And finally, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason, and peace out.